<clears throat> Welcome to the amphitheater. We've got uh, Robin and Julia Rogers, and they're from Norfolk, West, or Norfolk Virginia. And uh, they are visiting us here, and they're working on a sculpture that they've been working on all day. Uh, this morning, they made some parts for it. This afternoon, after lunch, they made some more parts. And uh, those are all being stored in some ovens here, here in the garage, and over in that uh, little box over there in the corner of the studio, and that's a pickup box. Both those ovens are holding around 1,000 degrees. Uh, they have boots. They have arms with hands. They've got a head. And what they're making is an anthropomorphic uh, sculpture of a rabbit person who is a glass blower. Do you guys know who uh, Little Joe is? No, you don't? Are you from Corning? No? Where are you from? Close by? Where? Niagara Falls? OK. Uh, did you notice there's a tower in the middle of the town? And there's like a little blue logo on there. Maybe you can't see it really good, but it's a picture of a glass blower. And it references Corning's uh, history in glass. Corning's known as the Crystal City uh, because of its uh, history that's been steeped in glass making. And uh, so what they're doing is they're doing an homage to the little glass blower that's on there. And his name's Little Joe. And this is going to be called, I don't know. Wait, what's, what's the name of this sculpture again? Huh? Uncle Joe. This is Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe the rabbit. And uh, you guys are super fortunate to be here to see this happen because it's such an exciting process. They are sculpting blown glass. And uh, this isn't something you see every day, especially with the detail and uh, patience that they put into this piece thus far. Again, this has taken all day so far. And uh, what you're going to see is the culmination of eight hours worth of work in the, in the studio and hundreds of dollars worth of glass color and uh, thousands of dollars worth of labor. So it's exciting, you know? People love seeing stuff like that, like race cars. It's really expensive, too. And uh, there's always a chance that it might smash on the ground, which makes it ever more exciting for everyone. So I'm glad you're here tonight. And hopefully we're going to see a lot more people showing up over the next few minutes. <clears throat> so Uncle Joe, no, I like that. Stay with it. Trust your gut. So that's Robin in the black shirt right there. That's Julia. And uh, they brought one of their assistants from Norfolk, who's actually originally from upstate New or downstate New York along the Hudson River. And that's Aaliyah Safar. She's opening the furnace door for Robin right there. <clears throat> welcome, welcome, welcome. Come on, get comfortable. We've got a big project going on right now with our visiting artists from Norfolk, Virginia and the Chrysler Museum of Art, where they have a beautiful glass studio uh, where both of these artists work. Uh, Robin is the manager of the glass studio at the Chrysler Museum. Julia is a teacher there, and she's also a teacher at the community college where they teach glass making as well. And both of them are, are trained as artists. And they use glass as a sculptural material. All right, so they're using some glass powder to color the glass. And what they're doing right now is uh, making uh, the final major elements for this sculpture, which is the torso and the legs, OK? But they're going to make the pants and a shirt. They don't have to make the torso and then put a shirt on it. So they're making the shirt and the pants. They already made boots and hands. They made the animal's head and uh, ears. And those are all being stored in ovens here in our hot shop. So we got a couple of um, great 
musical acts for you tonight. There's uh, Hannah Gill and the Hours, and they're from Austin, Texas, and they play uh, disco-infused pop music. And uh, up on the, uh, where are they? Oh no, they're in the, uh, they're in the auditorium. So that's Hannah Gill and the Hours, and then Svet. Svet is an electro hip hop violinist, and you can see Svet in the admissions lobby. So lots of fun music. Uh, there's plenty of wine to taste. There's over 20 wineries here giving samples and, uh, and also selling their products. And we have five cideries here. So this is the Finger Lakes uh, Wine and Cidery Tastings Night 2, along with having these great artists and musicians here. Uh, we have these wineries and cideries here for you guys to enjoy and sample some of their, uh, their yield. Do you have a question? How tall will the figure be? Um, I'm thinking it's going to be probably at least two, two and a half feet tall. It's pretty big. They made a lot of the components already. The ears are like this big. They're probably 10 inches long. Um, the boots are, yeah, they're probably six or seven inches maybe long, and the hands and the arms. So it's, it's going to be relatively uh, large. You know, normally we do kind of 10 inch pieces or so uh, to 12 inches for our normal demos. But you can see they have, uh, Julia's got quite a large piece of glass on the end of the blowpipe. That is a hollow bubble. It's coated in powdered glass, almost like an enamel on the outside. Hi, Mike. And so she's got the colors on there. That is hollow inside, but that probably weighs, I would say, maybe about eight pounds or so, six, six or eight pounds on the end of there. Probably feels like about 25 pounds on the end of a shovel because it's out extended on the end of that rod. And Julia is rolling it back and forth on this marver here. Uh, Robin's at this bench. He's going to have a bubble maybe a little smaller for the pants. And uh, maybe that'll be about four pounds or so. And so you got, uh, we're at 12 pounds there. I imagine this sculpture will probably weigh around 20 pounds, if not more. So it's going to be a lot of lifting. It's a good thing we have George Kennard here tonight because he's a strong guy. And uh, he's very good at moving large, heavy, and awkward pieces of glass. So uh, that gets me to our team. George is the guy in the gray sweater over there helping Julia turn the pipe. Megan Mathy is right there tending the bench and the tools at the bench and the torches right next to Julia. Julia, again, is in the blue shirt at the main bench. We've got Robin over here. He's working with Aaliyah. She also uh, came from Norfolk with them. And then Heather Spiewak is another person on our staff, and she's here with us tonight. Uh, my name's Jeff. If you have any questions for this first half hour or so, you just let me know, and I can answer for, for you. And uh, once we get more people in, I'll come out and mingle around and, and uh, see if you guys have any questions. Well, if you have any questions now, you can ask too. Just raise your hand, get my attention every any any which way you can. <clears throat> So Julia's using the jacks at the main bench there. Looks like Robin and Julia are kind of at a similar point. You know, they got their bubbles formed. Julia's a little, a couple steps ahead of Robin. And she's cutting a constriction in that bubble. Of course, any time we blow a bubble of glass or sculpt something on the end of the pipe, we usually need to make a weak spot between the end of the pipe 
and then the mass of glass that we're working on. And that weak spot becomes a very important and critical area because that, that's where it breaks free from that pipe. That's how we get it free from that pipe later on in the process. So you can also see a, a nice drawing that they have, and that drawing is to scale. So once in a while you'll see Julia or Robin coming over and sort of eyeing up their pieces that they're forming to this chalk drawing that Julia made on the floor here. I was joking because uh, she drew this this morning. They've been working on all the parts, and all this time she keeps having to redraw it because this is such a high traffic area. This is where our glass is. So people are walking over this drawing all day. But that gives you an idea of what it is. You can see it's like Little Joe on the Little Joe Tower, but it's a big rabbit. This is Uncle Joe. Does anybody know uh, who Little Joe is? I've asked some of you already. Anybody from Corning who knows who Little Joe is? Does anybody want to know who Little Joe is who doesn't know who Little Joe is? Is anybody afraid to find out who Little Joe is? <laughs> Hi. Do you know who Little Joe is? All right. Where does Little Joe live? Huh? With his parents? No, he lives up in a tower. Yeah. Yeah, the tube, the tube pulling tower that Corning Glass Works made uh, 90 years ago to pull uh, to pull thermometer tubing vertically. But up on that tower in the middle of Corning, if you've ever seen that tower, you can maybe get your binoculars or do some close looking. You'll see a little image, a logo. It's Corning Incorporated's old logo. It's a glass blower. And that glass blower's name is Little Joe. So they're making this uh, little bunny rabbit, Little Joe, Uncle Joe, in honor of Little Joe here and in uh, celebration of their visit to Corning. Oh, great. It sounds like one of the bands has started. And this sounds like our, uh, like, uh, what's, his, what's his name? I'm sorry. Svet. This is Svet. Does anybody heard of uh, Svet? He's an electro-pop violinist. He was on America's Got Talent. No? No, I've not seen that program. But sounds pretty cool. So he's playing some Michael Jackson, sounds like. So Robin and Julia are a husband and wife team. They got kids. They left their kids at home to come to Corning. And they've got uh, a good friend who's watching them for them, who they trust, so they don't have to worry about their children while they're here making art. And hopefully, they're at home in their PJs, watching the live stream, seeing how mom and dad are doing here at Corning. If you guys don't have your PJs on, you might want to think about getting them on. So both Robin and Julia both studied art in college. Robin went to CCAC in Columbus. Hi. Cal uh, the Columbus College of Art and, and Craft. And uh, for graduate school, he went to Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. Julia studied art at SIU as well, and also at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. The two met in, in Montana. They were business partners, and their relationship grew, and now they're making collaborative sculpture and works together. And uh, this series they're working on, and what you're seeing being made tonight is from this series. It's a series of anthropomorphic animals. So they're part people, part animals, 
part action figure and fashion doll. And uh, if you get a chance, come on up and look at some of their sketches and drawings and some of the materials they're using um, so you can learn a little bit more about their process. You can also visit their website. And if you're really interested, and uh, maybe even interested in buying a piece of art or looking at their art, uh, there's some business cards here. And you can visit their website at Julia and Robin robinandjulia.com, either one of those. So take a card, check out their website, and uh, maybe if you, even if you have a smartphone, you can check it out and see some of their amazing work and what you're in store uh, to see here tonight. So we're also live streaming tonight, so uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us remotely from your computers, laptops, and smart devices, or whatever you call them. And uh, if you have any questions, you can let us know online, and we'll try and answer them as best as we can. And also, if you have any questions here in the amphitheater, let me know so I can repeat the questions in case any of our Visitors online have the same questions, and we'll try and answer those for you, too. All right, so George and Julia are punting this bubble that she's formed. So they're flipping it around. If you've never seen glass blowing before, uh, this is kind of an interesting maneuver. It's basically trading the pipes and switching it around so you can work on the other end. Because really, when you're blowing glass, when you're forming glass or sculpting it, you can only work on one end at, the t at a time. You can only get one end really hot and form it. You can only focus your attention on one part of the object at a time. So here we go. They're going to break it free. It breaks free from the pipe. And that is called the punty transfer. So this is a traditional way of switching something around a vessel. Let's say he was making a bowl. You'd switch it around and then open up that hole to form the rim or the diameter of the top of the piece. And uh, the same. Techniques carry over into sculpting glass. However, the way the thing is going to be treated after this is going to be much different than it would if, if she was just forming a vessel. So you'll notice uh, when George is heating for a sculptural piece or Aaliyah is heating for a sculptural piece, they flip it back and forth rather than spin it in one direction. Uh, when you're blowing, you, you spin in one direction, maybe back and forth a little bit. But there's a lot more turning. It's more like working on a lathe. But when you're sculpting the glass, uh, it's much different. You're using gravity to let it sag and uh, create uh, compound forms and shapes. And then you use tools to press into it. It's much different than blowing. But it's similar in a lot of different ways. And you share a lot of the same traditional techniques that go back over 2,000 years. People have been blowing glass for 2,000 years, believe it or not. And they've been forming glass for over 5,000 years. In the beginning, they'd use solid glass, push it into molds for jewelry and things like that. And they even were able to make hollow vessels by wrapping glass around a core of clay. That's called core forming. It would take days and days to make a piece, lots of labor. And then around 50 BC, glass blowing was invented. And that just opened everything up, made glass affordable for everyone because vessels could be made quickly and easily. So that was. Uh, 2,000 years ago. And a lot of the tools they're using here to make this modern sculpture are from designs that go back that far. That's Svet playing. Has anybody seen Svet on TV? The guy who's playing right now. Did you see Sped on TV on American's Got Talent? Was he good? Yeah, really good. He's here tonight. You hear him playing? Yeah. Are you friends with him? No? Maybe? A little bit? You're with? Oh. Say again? Man crush? Yeah, that's okay. 
He's good, isn't he? It's really good. And you know what? We've got another band here, too. I'm going to have to check out what their name is because I already forget. I'm not much up on the pop culture stuff. You can ask anybody I work with. Let's see. Oh, yeah, Hannah Gill and the Hours. They're going to be in the auditorium tonight, too. So those are the two uh, musical attractions we have tonight. We hope to get to enjoy them in addition to seeing this art being made here in the amphitheater. All right, so Julia's making use of a pad there. It's made out of wet newspaper to shape the glass. It's kind of odd to think that you actually use paper to shape something that's over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. But it's a really nice tool for doing it because it's soft. It doesn't scratch the glass. It doesn't gouge it. And you can easily manipulate the glass with this tool, almost as if you're using your bare hand, except you've got a nice layer of paper between. So my guess, and what I'm theorizing, I'm not exactly sure how this is all going to come together, but uh, the piece that Robin has there is basically uh, the trunk part of a shirt. So the opening is like the opening on the bottom of the shirt. And then she's got some arms that she made, some sleeves that she made earlier, uh, just after lunch, that are, that are in this oven over here. Or maybe they're over in that oven. I'm not sure where they are, but they're being kept at 1,000 degrees. Because you can make a lot of parts in glass making. But you can't just leave them sitting out on the table, pick them up, and then reheat them again. You have to keep them idle at uh, around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit because glass experiences thermal shock. So if it goes up and down in temperature too quickly, it breaks because as glass cools, it shrinks. As it heats, it expands, just like any other material. Uh, but glass is very sensitive to that shrinking and growing. And uh, that stress from the rapid cooling and rapid uh, heat up can cause it to break. That's called thermal shock. So even when we're finished with this piece, when it's all put together, it still has to go into an oven. And it's not really finished at all. It has to sit in that oven and slowly cool for many, many hours. And this piece will probably cool for about 36 hours or so because it's uh, very complex. There's a lot of variation from thick glass to thin glass, and as you might suspect, the thick glass is going to keep that heat a lot longer than the thin glass. The thin glass dissipates the heat much more quickly. So we put into the oven to homogenize the temperature, get everything the same temperature, and then we slowly, slowly, slowly cool it so everything moves and cools together. So in a couple days then, after this piece is finished, we'll be able to pull it out of the oven. And after you work so hard on a piece, I tell you what, it's like Christmas morning when you come in and you know you're going to be able to open that oven and see that piece. Now, that's no guarantee. I'm not making a guarantee that this piece is actually going to make it into the oven. Uh, they have been working on it all day, but there is a chance uh, in this art, in this craft, uh, that the piece can hit the floor because we're making a sculpture, but inevitably this sculpture has to be attached to these irons, uh, usually on a connection that's no bigger than a, a, a dime or a quarter. So it's a very precarious art, and you have to be uh, very good at keeping things on center. You have to be very good about not banging into things because any sharp tap or uh, disturbance on that iron can break it free. It can just pop off of there. So, you have to be very careful. And if everything goes right, in a couple hours, you're going to have this sculpture all finished and cozy in that oven at around 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So, that's what we're looking for here. All right, so, what's going on at this bench here? Robin, oh, well, maybe, yeah. 
Let's see if we get the... Okay, so we're back to Robin. Now you can see uh, on the screens that um, Aliyah is turning this piece for Robin. And he's making the pants there. And that is that little hole is essentially where the pants will connect to the shirt. So that's the top part of the pants. That's on the end of uh, the bubble with the little hole in it. And Robin is getting an iron ready to attach over that hole. It's called a punty. And just like Julia did about five minutes ago, uh, they're going to break that free, switch it around to the other pipe, so Robin can then make the individual legs of the pants. Right now, you've got the bum and the sort of the top part of the hips. And then you have the legs, but they're still in one piece. So he has to go back break it off of the iron, put it on another iron, and then uh, cut the, that bubble apart to make two legs, two separate legs. At least that's, that's what I think. That's what I theorize is going to happen. I have never seen them make this piece before, uh, but I know I'm familiar with some of the techniques, so I'll do my best to kind of anticipate for you what's going to be happening. Wow, that's fat playing. Welcome to those of you just joining us here in the amphitheater. We've got Robin and Julia Rogers here from Norfolk, Virginia, and they're working on a glass sculpture that they've been chipping away at all day. They've been making parts on this piece since 9 a.m. this morning. They've got all kinds of pieces. They're making an anthropomorphic sculpture of a part rabbit, part person. And uh, they've got a drawing here on the floor which maybe you'll get to see here in a little bit. Some of you might be able to see it if you're up here. And uh, they've already made the head. Robin made the head and the ears. They have the blowpipe and the glass on it made. The arms are made and the hands, the sleeves, the boots. So right now they're working on the shirt and they're working on the pants. They're going to put those together and then start adding all those elements that they made throughout the day. And um, if you didn't hear before, this sculpture is going to be called Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe, in honor of Little Joe on Little Joe Tower here in Corning. So the, kind of in the uh, classic glass blowing pose. All right, I'm going to rest my voice. Megan Matthews is going to take over talking. Thank you, Megan. Are you enjoying 2300, Megan? Yeah, it's a lot of fun. All right, well, welcome. 2300 is one of my very favorite events that we host here at the Corning Museum of Glass. And it's something that really, I think, uh, takes the edge off our Corning winters, so. It is a lot of fun. It's a, a cool thing. It's great to see the community out here. We get so many people. And uh, it's a lot of fun, so thanks for being here. I think here. the entire city of Corning makes their way to the museum on these Thursday nights. But this is a really fun project to uh, get to help out with and get to see come together. It's been going on all day long. And so I know Jeff has been talking about it, but I'll fill everyone in as they join us here in the amphitheater and on the live stream. Been making body parts for this little Uncle Joe character that they're creating. And it's um, really bringing together some of my very favorite things that it's not a little person is a little rabbit that they're sculpting. And so this is a rabbit who's blowing glass. And uh, we have rabbit heads and bunny hands and uh, boots and sleeves and all kinds of body parts that are stored away in our different ovens. They've been putting all these pieces away throughout the day. And then tonight, you get to see the fun part. You get to see us assemble all of these appendages, all of these uh, little features together. This is a really fun type of project for a glassmaker to uh, get to see come to fruition that um, bringing these components, attaching one to another, is, uh, feels a lot like you're uh, involved in a live sporting event. There's so much communication and teamwork that has to, to be completely in sync. And so over here on 
Julia's bench, she is creating the torso and the shirt of the bunny rabbit. And so she's picked out a really beautiful blue-green color. Right where she is making the holes, it's where the arms are going to be attached or the sleeves will be attached. So that's the shoulders of the bunny. And one of the funny conversations that was happening earlier uh, was deciding whether the bunny shirt is going to be tucked or untucked into its little trousers. <laughs> and so, of course, on this bench over here, we've got Robin working on the trousers. And so a few minutes ago, you might have seen them come together and kind of size up and measure those two pieces, you know, not sticking them together, but just giving it a, a close look and deciding, does the shirt get tucked or untucked? And so it was at that point that she kind of rounded out uh, the bottom of the shirt, decided tucked is the way to go. But that raises the next question, flair. What kind of belt, what kind of accessories do we need little Uncle Joe to wear? And so I think the belt is going to be a decision that will be made based on timing, right? If we have enough time to add a belt, then the rabbit will be that much more fabulous. So this is one of the, the few times where we actually have a time constraint. It's a really wonderful luxury to get to bring artists into the amphitheater here at the Corning Museum of Glass. We have all of the space, all of the tools, all of the teammates that you could want to make anything. Um, but at an event like tonight, our goal is to be finished at 8 p.m. And so I, all of the work that they did today was uh, with that deadline in mind. So she's using a little torch here to heat up the uh, shoulders of our rabbit. This torch has uh, oxygen and natural gas, giving it this really intense heat. It burns between three and 4,000 degrees. But she used that torch, she used a tungsten pick to kind of create a hole, a little bit of uh, air pressure relief once we attach the sleeves. And then she's going back in with her tweezers and kind of boring it out, making sure it's the right diameter. So for those of you sitting up here in the mezzanine in the amphitheater, you might be enjoying one of the things that I, I really love about the shop, and that's the smells of the shop, surprisingly enough. As uh, Robin is over here sculpting the trousers of the little bunny, he's using a really neat tool. It's a cork paddle to shape the glass. And people often think that we're crazy when we reach for a tool that's made of cork or made of wood and use it against glass that's way over 1,000 degrees. But it's a pretty fantastic shaping tool because it's so gentle on the glass. If he was using a paddle that was made of steel or graphite, well, maybe that paddle would rob so much heat out of the glass that it would get stiff really, really quickly. The cork does that. Uh, it's much more gentle. It's not going to rob the glass of heat to that great extent. And the bonus is that it makes this really wonderful kind of campfire smell. So where I'm standing, I, I get to smell the burning cork, probably where those of you are sitting up here and our mezzanine, you can experience that too. You find there's two camps of glass blowers, those that love that campfire smell and those who don't really care for it. But there's a, a universally hated smell in the glass studio, and that's the smell of burning tennis shoe. If anyone ever steps on a piece of hot glass, everybody knows it and everybody's sad. But you can see Julia using those little cork paddles as well. So this is one of the few times where you'll see a gaffer wearing gloves. You know, people often marvel when they see us with our bare hands holding on to these stainless steel rods, uh, holding on to tools so close to the glass. But we need the dexterity. We need nimble fingers. And so it's only in a situation where she's doing a lot of this sculpting, she's got someone else to manage the pipe and manage the turning that she can comfortably wear these gloves. All right, so back to the bench over here where we've got the trousers coming together. Eventually, this is going to be split into two different legs. So we've still got a ways to go down here. And it looks like we're starting to create some kind of contours, definition, maybe some muscles on our Uncle Joe the bunny rabbit blowing glass. Now, something we have to be so conscientious about the entire time we're working is to always keep these pieces and parts above 1,000 degrees. If any section of the object falls below that threshold, 
you know, where the glass is connected to the steel, if that gets a little bit too cold, we're going to find out because the glass will crack and break. And so as they shape the glass, as they manipulate the glass, we take what we call flashes of heat, where you step away, you bring it back to that reheating chamber and keep everything at a good, safe and stable temperature. So glass blowers like to work as efficiently as possible for that reason. You know, we only have uh, you know, seconds or minutes to get a step done, complete some shaping before the glass becomes too rigid. And so every move is planned. Every time that glass returns from the reheating furnace, Julia and Robin, they know exactly what their next step is going to be. Ooh, so here we go. We're creating the individual legs in the trousers. He's using a, a great big pair of shears here to actually cut right into the glass. If he has enough heat there, it should feel pretty spongy, um, like you're cutting through a, maybe a garden hose, kind of that rubbery resistance. And it looks like that was a, a pretty perfect heat. Again, definitely a moment where he wants to be wearing those leather gloves. Can you see how close his fingers are to the trouser legs there? You know, for the glass to be so soft that he could snip right through it, well, it had to be probably north of 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And his knuckles were within an inch of that material. So definitely the, the gloves are important there. So Julia is using a tool called the taglio, and it looks like she's creating some kind of contours and definition down the back of the bunny rabbit, so kind of his spine. And uh, great attention to detail. When we're talking about how the shirt of the bunny rabbit is going to be tucked into its trousers, it looks like she's creating some kind of little ruffles right at the edge there. So you'll actually be able to uh, see the detail of the folds of the fabric getting tucked in. So one thing I'm impressed with from my uh, vantage point right here, looking at Robin's trouser legs, is that the legs match, OK? He had to you know, go in while that glass was hot, while it was moving, while it was falling with gravity, and divide it. He had to cut through it uh, and just eyeball where exactly 50-50 is to make matching legs. If he cut that a little bit too far to the left or right, make one leg thicker than the other, too bad. There's no do-overs. There's no recovery from that. So. You get one shot on a move like that. And looks like he did a, a really beautiful job on that symmetry. So it looks like Julia is continuing to create the little folds in the bottom of the shirt. And that's where this uh, hot torch she's using is so, so useful. She can go in and heat up the skin of the glass and the rest of the structure of it, the shape that they've created, the shape of the torso and the shoulders, that's all staying really nice and stiff and stable and rigid. So she can get the, the softness right where she needs it and not undo any of the completed work. So Robin and Julia are a really fun, really gracious team to work with. They brought their assistant, Aaliyah, with them. And then we've got the Zemog team on the floor as well. We've got George Kennard helping to take heats on the torso, Heather Spiewak over here on Robin's bench, Jeff Mack on the floor as well. And you cannot make work that is this complicated at this scale without a great team there to support you. I think the teamwork between Robin and Julia is really fantastic as well. They're a husband and wife team. And they've been making art together uh, since, I think, about 2005. You know, they had a studio together out in Montana. They left Montana to go on to graduate school. Robin went to uh, Southern Illinois University. And Julia went to Bowling Green University to get their master's degrees. But the, all of their work that they make now is completely collaborative. It's collaborative in the execution and in the concept. And seeing them work really beautifully together has really definitely been a, a treat for us here at CMOG. So the plan going forward as we kind of complete the trousers here uh, eventually, the legs of those trousers, they're going to get opened up. And they've pre-made boots and feet for the bunny rabbit. Those boots and feet are going to get attached kind of at the knee 
uh, right below the trouser openings. And then this entire uh, pants section of the bunny, the entire lower half of the bunny, is going to be attached to a different metal rod on the bottom of the feet. So at that point, they'll be able to attach the torso that Julia is working on. They'll put those two pieces together. Once those are assembled, I think then comes the collar on the shirt, then the head of the bunny rabbit, then the sleeves and the arms. And the best part, I think, is this gesture of the bunny. It's going to be holding its arms up in the air, there's an iconic image here in Corning, New York of Little Joe. It's the uh, image of the gaffer that's on the uh, tower right here in downtown Corning. And they are creating that same gesture with a bunny rabbit. And you know, if it all comes together, the finale will be to put a blowpipe into that bunny rabbit's hands. So we've been making all these pieces and parts and components all day long, getting ready for that great finale. Oh, so it looks like these are the buttons on the bunny shirt that she's been creating. So the, the seam down the middle of the shirt and now buttons on the front of the shirt. So fabulous details. So each team working away on our two different benches here to uh, shape the trousers of the bunny rabbit, to shape the torso of the bunny rabbit. And in this great piece of equipment right here on my uh, left side is our garage. This is what's holding all of the pre-made pieces at a nice high temperature. So we've got a rabbit head inside this oven. We've got arms, hands, sleeves, shoes. All of those pieces and parts are being held right above 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So the garage is a great way to park your glass. You can store it away for a time when you're ready. If we were leaving those pieces out in the ambient temperature, they would all break apart. They would uh, cool down too quickly, they would crack, and they wouldn't be at a temperature that you could fuse them to the finished sculpture. So you might have seen what looked like an interesting calisthenic exercise in the middle of the floor here. But what Robin was doing was actually sizing up the trousers that he's sculpting to the illustration that he's made in the center of the floor here. So if you can't see it where you are out there in the crowd, I encourage you to do a lap around our mezzanine and look down over the balcony to see this drawing. But this is what the finished sculpture is going to look like. And they've been using this drawing that's been right here on the floor all day to make the different pieces and parts to make sure that everything is going to be the appropriate scale. So he just carried the uh, trousers over and just kind of eyeballed it, lined it up with the drawing. So we are getting ready to start the assembly process. It's about to get pretty exciting uh, because we're going to attach the first boot to the legs of the bunny. So Jeff Mack is collecting glass from our melting furnace. Right there in the center of the room is a furnace that's over 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. The glass in there is the consistency of honey. So Jeff can collect a little bit right on the end of the metal. He's going to shape it up. 
and he's going to stick it to one of the feet or one of the boots that's parked inside the garage. So this is how he's going to attach it and, and take it out, heat it up, and get ready to attach it. So again, great communication happening between Robin and Julia and the rest of the team. Everyone's touching base, making sure that they're all on the same page as these processes move forward. All right, we're going to be trading reheating furnaces. So the shirt is moving over here to the bench on the right side. The trousers are moving over to the larger reheating furnace. So. This is all like a choreographed dance as the teams are talking, making sure that everyone has the right amount of heat to make this kind of long trip across the hot shop floor, not letting anything get too cold. And here we go. Jeff is picking up the first boot. And that one was situated inside one of our pickup ovens. And so there you can see that view of it going into the reheating furnace. So that's always a precarious moment. When we attach that punty, that steel rod, onto the bottom of the boot, we're making a connection that needs to stick and hold. It needs to be good and hot and strong. We don't want that to fall off. But it's also a connection that's designed to be temporary. We don't want that punty fused to the bottom of the foot forever. So it can't be too hot. It can't be too cold. It's um, just such a, a delicate thing to get that heat and that timing right. And so Jeff, he immediately took it from that pickup oven and right into the reheating furnace. You know, glass uh, is really fragile when it goes through these dramatic temperature changes. When it goes from the 1,000 degree oven into this ambient 80 degree space and then into a 2,000 degree oven, well, those are big changes to subject your glass to. But if it makes it through that transition all in one piece, which it looks like this has, we can feel pretty great. And look at this multitasking. We've got Julia over there kind of addressing the punty on the bottom of the boot. While that's happening, Aaliyah was standing, holding and turning the trouser legs while Robin torched the, what will eventually be the knee of the bunny rabbit. And so making sure that everybody, again, has the right amount of heat, that everybody can reach the right tools. So there's another torch that we're using over there as well. It's the great big fluffy torch that you can see that's in the kind of holster or cradle up there. Some people call that a torch a leaf burner. I call it a ponytail burner because of the height that it sits. But that's a great torch to use when you want a uh, less precise heat. If you want to heat a larger area uh, very rapidly, that fluffy torch is going to help do the job. Now, George over here, he is really babysitting right now. He's got the torso of the bunny rabbit. You can see all the buttons running down the front of the shirt. You know that Julia made all those dainty little pleats around the waist of the bunny rabbit. And so George's task is to keep this object hot enough that it's not going to crack and break, but also not overheating it. You think, well, obviously you would want to err on the side of safety, keep it a little bit hotter so that you don't crack it. Well, if he gets it too hot, oh, look at that. We just brought the the boot right onto the leg of the bunny. And you can see it's moving around. That knee is wiggling. Do you need another door? So you could see the weight of that boot started to bend the knee. And so she used gravity, just flipped it over, kept it running nice and straight. I'm sure can. All right, so one leg attached, we've got another leg to go. This hose in Julia's hand, that's compressed air. So she can go right in and blow on the hottest section to help stabilize it, keep it from wiggling around. And then she goes back and she torches the more vulnerable area. Do you want this right door as well? Okay, so Jeff is moving on. He's going to be picking up the other leg of the bunny. 
So making another one of those punties. So the area right now that's really most vulnerable is where the top of the trousers is attached to the steel rod. And so going in with that fluffy torch and uh, heating it very carefully is uh, so important. You know, every time we go into the reheating furnace, that's a great big barrel of heat that's going to uh, flash the entire piece of glass. But the bottom of the shoe is the first end to uh, go into that hot space. It's the last section to come out. All on its own, that wants to be much hotter than the top of the trousers. And so when we are at the bench giving it that extra heat, what we're trying to do is kind of uh, even out the temperature, make sure that it's uniform from top to bottom. And so we've got a, a substantial amount of weight here. And so you're going to see the team take turns uh, picking up that large piece of glass. We've got one of our uh, strongest gaffers here, George Kennard, to help uh, lift this object once we get another leg attached. But you think about the finished uh, bunny rabbit sculpture, it's going to be uh, a few feet tall. It's, you, know, you can see the illustration of it over there. And this is made of glass. There's going to be a lot of really heavy components. And you might think that's a, a reasonable object to pick up and to move around. But when you think about it over 1,000 degrees, it's on the end of a great big long steel pipe. So all of that weight is far away from your body. And so it feels exponentially heavier the further away you have to be from that heat. And so getting ready to attach the uh, punty to the next boot waiting inside that furnace. So if you're joining us on the live stream, we've got Amanda here to help answer questions. So you can submit your questions online. If you have a question right here in the amphitheater, you can uh, raise your hand, flag me down. I can relay your questions to the team. And so you can see that this object is in constant motion. Gravity always wants to bend those legs. It wants to pull them down toward the floor. And so having to flip something 180 degrees back and forth uh, is really important. We're also being um, careful not to just rotate it consistently. You know, the heat and the rotation might want to make this object start to twist a little bit. It might create some torque. But when you want to maintain that really nice kind of uh, rate or bilateral symmetry on a sculpture, turning in both directions is really important. One of my favorite things about working in the shop here in Corning is the view that we're getting inside that reheating chamber. And people have asked, what kind of camera can sit inside the furnace? Is there a GoPro Inferno? But that's not a camera technology that exists yet. So when we want that awesome view here at the Glass Museum, we solve our problem with glass technology. We've got an ordinary camera. The little camera even has its own fan that blows on it all the time to keep it cool. But that camera is looking through a very special piece of glass, a type of glass that's called fused silica. Now, fused silica is a corning technology. It's developed in the 1930s. They're trying to replicate quartz. And this type of glass melts over 4,000 degrees. And so it's the type of glass that's at the core of a fiber optic cable. It's the type of glass that they put in all the windows of spacecraft because it can withstand the heat of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And it's the type of window that gives us this awesome view into our 2,000 degree reheating chamber. All right, so looks like we are approaching the, the moment where we'll be attaching the second boot onto the trousers of the bunny rabbit. And I just want to draw your attention for a moment to George here in the middle of the shop. He is creating another punty. So this is a, a great big piece of steel that's going to manage the weight of the entire finished sculpture. And this mass of glass that he has on the head of it is going to need to be a, a hot, strong connection that will hold on to everything. It's going to get attached to the bottom of the bunny's boots. So if you've just joined us from the auditorium, you can come in and uh, take a lap around the mezzanine. There's a drawing right here in the middle of the floor of the finished product that we're creating tonight. There's the iconic symbol in Corning of Little Joe, the glass blower that's on the uh, tower downtown. And they, instead of making a, a Little Joe that's a person, they are making a bunny rabbit. And Robin and Julia have named it Uncle Joe. They said is there walking around Corning and they're sharing their plans, they're sharing the idea about what they're going to make tonight with everyone. 
Yeah, they all, all the locals describe little Joe as their Uncle Joe. So. All right, so there's the second leg attached. And so now we need to free the punty off the bottom of that boot. And so they're just holding a pair of she uh, steel shears and then a vibration broke perfectly. The crowd here goes wild. And so that's always a tense moment. When we break a glass and it breaks where we intended it to, we celebrate, okay? So you're gonna see a lot of these transfers. You're gonna see a lot of the body parts coming together and you're just gonna need to keep that level of enthusiasm nice and high. But what could have happened? If there had been any other weak area on that object, if any other area had been too cold, well, when they tap the steel, that sends a vibration down toward the glass, it finds the coldest spot, and that's where it separates. They designed everything so that that vibration would travel right to the bottom of the boot, and that's where the glass would separate. If they did it wrong, it could have also broken in another location. And so when you see them using the fluffy torch here on the top of the trousers, on the kneecaps, that's all about making sure those other joints, those other potential stress points in the glass are creating a, uh, the right fuse for their function. So George has taken another gather on our punty. So this, this glass here that's attached to the end of the steel, this is not gonna be part of the finished sculpture. This is just the glue that's gonna hold on to it, that's gonna help us uh, attach the steel handle. This is an incredible amount of glass. This is a really large punty. But when you think about the scale of this object and all of the, the force as we you know, move it back and forth from the reheating furnace to the bench, it's the amount that we need. And so this is the time where we're going to be able to uh, finesse the gesture in those bunny rabbit's legs. We want to make sure that the knees are bent the right way, that the feet and the ankles are situated just right. Because once we move on from this step, there's no going back. Glass blowing is a really linear proce process. Every single step has been carefully planned. And once we move on from the kind of lower half of the rabbit to adding the torso, adding the collar, the head, and the arms of the bunny, we're not gonna go back and move the feet around. That section is gonna need to be stiff and stable. So this is our chance to perfect it and then be happy, be satisfied with it. where the punty came away from the bottom of the boot, you might have seen it left a little bit of glass behind. And so that's what they are kind of cleaning up. And, you know, a really good analogy for what's going on. It's like the bunny rabbit stepped in chewing gum, right? It's got a little blob of clear glass on the bottom of its shoe. They're getting it really hot, so it's squishy and stringy like chewing gum and kind of stripping it away from the bottom of that boot. And so you can see he heats the glass. Robin heats the glass. He pinches it. He pulls it. And he actually is going in with a pair of shears and just snipping it away. And the glass, again, is the right temperature that you can cut through it soft and spongy. So another thing that I'm marveling at as a glass maker myself and as a uh, kind of novice glass sculptor is the symmetry of those feet. When you see them go into the reheating furnace, you can see how perfectly they match you know, these were made individually today. And they might have taken caliper measurements on the boots themselves, but to get that uh, perfect match just comes down to experience. You know, my, my guess is that the first time they attempted to make a pair of boots, maybe one was a little bit larger than the other. Maybe they incorporated that into the gesture of the sculpture or the narrative of the story they were telling. But it's, it's really fantastic to work with a team that uh, knows their body of work so well and can put these pieces together so elegantly. When we are making blown glass vessels, which is something that all glass blowers get introduced to, we all always think about the proportion of the object. If we're making a vase, it might have a stem and a foot, it might have a lid attached, but we think about the proportion of that object and usually we describe it using body parts. You know, the bottom of a vase is also called the foot. You know, we, call, we describe the shoulder, the neck, the lip, the mouth of a piece of glass. And so here, when we actually get to have a character being created, this beautiful little sculpture, you know, that proportion conversation doesn't change. You know, we're still thinking about 
the way everything is going to fit together, and the fact that it you know, has, is pre-made and then brought together just adds this level of complexity. It's not something that you can adjust later on. If you put the torso onto the pants and realize the torso is too short or too long, too bad, you know? I love this move a moment ago where they actually used the floor of our studio to make sure that the feet were nice and level. You might have seen them just stand those legs right on our concrete floor, kind of flex them and bend them into shape. That's right, Megan. All right, so George is preparing the large punty, as Megan was saying. And he's going to sculpt it into a, sort of a Y shape, like a slingshot shape, so that each edge of the, the Y will go on, or each tip of the Y will go on one of the feet. They'll attach it, break the pants, the trousers off of the blowpipe. And uh, then they'll attach the top of the shirt, the torso part, to the waistline, and you can see how it's all coming together. And all the parts uh, that they have that they're applying, like those boots that we picked up out of that oven over there, uh, those are things that they made earlier in the day today. This piece is taken all day. So you guys are here to see the culmination of a large glass sculpture. This is Robin and Julia Rogers, if you're just joining us. They're from Norfolk, Virginia. And... Uh, Robin is the studio manager at the Chrysler Museum. And Julia is a teacher there. And they're both glass artists. They work together. Husband and wife team. They've got two children who are hopefully uh, watching what their parents are doing here. Yep. Center to center. So you also uh, want to know that this is a sculpture of an anthropomorphic creature, part human, part rabbit, who's also a glass blower. His name's Uncle Joe. He's named after Little Joe. There's the drawing. This is the drawing they made this morning that they've had to draw over and over because we keep walking over it. It's a uh, in a high traffic area of the studio. I don't know if that's a purposeful technique. I don't think so. But this morning, Julia drew that on the floor. And since, uh, since about that time, since 9 o'clock this morning, we've been just chipping away at all these little parts. And uh, in incredible creativity in this team of artists. It's really great to see them here. I've known them for quite some time. I met... Uh, Robin and Julia, when Julia was going to school for her master's degree in art at Bowling Green State University. So I was living in Ohio at the time, and uh, they were both going to school there. But they're both trained as artists. Both went to art school. And uh, you can see how they come up with their designs for the glass. So the making of the glass, even though it's taking so long and it takes so much effort, is just one step in the process. There's a lot of thinking that goes into these pieces uh, beforehand. So the, the fun thing about glass making like this is you, you plan, you plan, you plan, you imagine, you visualize, and then you execute this thing. And there's a lot of risk. Both these pieces that they've spent hours on uh, are on the end of long rods with a, con a connection point that's maybe the size of a quarter or a half dollar. So if they knock that into something or uh, anything like that, you know, it could break free. So there we go. You guys are here to witness the action. All right, that's Heather Spiewak. And Megan Matthey helping Julia Rogers out at bench one. Over at this bench, Robin and George are working on the punty. 
Glassmakers say that the piece is only as good as the punty, so this, this is very important. It is a linchpin in the process here. Once the boots are attached to that punty, it'll break off of there, and then everything is going to be built on there. Hours and hours of work, so it's got to be just right. Yeah, that's why we had George make the punty. He's got a lot of experience, and he knows what it takes to make a punty for heavy things like this. So uh, Robin and Julia brought their assistant, Aaliyah uh, Safar. She lives in Norfolk, but she's originally from New York State. And uh, she's from down along the Hudson River near New York City. And she came here to help them out. So she's been helping us out today. It's taken a lot of help, a lot of work to get all these parts made for you guys to see this piece uh, come into fruition tonight. The music you're hearing is Svet. Electro pop violinist. You may have seen him on uh, America's Got Talent. He is a star, and he's here with us tonight, too. So we got all kinds of stars. We've also got Hannah Gill in the Hours in the auditorium. So if you haven't seen that, make sure to check that out. All right, so they're attaching the punty. This is one of those moment of truth things, one of those uh, epic moments here. And you can see that punny is much, much hotter than the legs and the boots. It's glowing orange. So that's going to be moving quite a bit when they break it free. So Julie's got some air, some compressed air. She's blowing on that glass. Helps to cool it down a little bit. All right, here we go. Fingers crossed. We want this to go just right. Little water on the joint between the pipe and the bubble. A sharp tap to the iron. And there we have the punty transfer. I tell you what, it only gets more difficult from here. There's a lot more left to do. So they're going to be joining up. The shirt bubble, if you were here for a little while, you know that they've been working on two bubbles. Robin made the pants or the trousers bubble. He put the boots on that they made earlier in uh, the afternoon. Julia made this uh, torso part, the shirt. It doesn't have the sleeves on yet. The sleeves come next. That's going to get attached to the waistline of the pants, and then everything's built just like a little action figure. I'm sorry, like a giant action figure. So definitely, if you get a chance, come on down, check out their sketches and some of the ideas. Robin and Julia are here with us until Sunday, so we've had them. Uh, we'll have them for five days here, and they've got a lot of cool plans. They've got a lot of pieces in mind that they want to try, and uh, we're really lucky to have them. We're learning a lot. Okay, so they were just sizing it up there. Now, traditionally, this technique is called in calmo when you join two bubbles together and you have a band. I'm sorry you've asked too many questions today. You're at your quota. I'm just kidding. What's your question? How heavy is the piece? George, how, ma how many pounds is that right now? 20 pounds. So by the time it's finished, it's probably going to be like 50 pounds. Because you got the head and all the details. It's very thick glass. You've got the arms and the hands. And then uh, they've got a little surprise at the end. They're going to put the blowpipe in his hands with a little bubble. I might even give you just a sneak peek, if that's OK. But you could see uh, the little Joe bubble. So we do have, this is a glass blowing rabbit. Oh, was that, was that I'm not supposed to do? The drawing's right there, Robin. They, they already know it's going to happen. 
Yeah, that's what people expect to see when they see glass blowing, or they want to see glass blowing. They think there's going to be a trumpet player blowing bubbles out of glass. But most of it is handwork. It's not really blowing. You just blow the air in to get the vessel hollow inside. But from there, there's just a lot of uh, stretching and pulling and manipulating of the glass. So it looks like Julia is going to take off some of the scrap glass there that's left over from the attachment on the blowpipe, on the last blowpipe it was on. How you doing, Aaliyah? Yeah, are you, are you stoked to be here at Corning? Super excited to be here, yeah. This is a great place to be for any glass artist. What a collection. What a place to see. Lots going on. We've got a lot of action going on at the studio, too. We teach classes here and uh, all kinds of fun stuff going on. Lots of things to learn, see, and do here at the Corning Museum, even in the wintertime. So make sure to come on out if you haven't been here in a while. So I'm just wondering if anybody's got any questions in the audience right now. Any questions that I could answer? No questions. All right. Well, uh, we must be doing a good job talking about the process. How about up in the peanut gallery? Any questions? Well, just let me know. Raise your hand up. Shout out. What's your question, sir? Why did they take off the old punty, though, so the scrap that's left over on the boots? Uh, they wanted a nice flat surface. It's about surface area. And the old glass that's on there might have a, sh a jagged edge, so you don't want to attach fresh glass to that cold, jagged edge. They made it nice and smooth, so there's a lot of surface area for it to attach to. Because by the time this is done, it's going to be like 50 pounds. So you need that surface area on this type of piece. Now. If you've seen glass blowing before, maybe you've seen glass blowing and, and us making like a vase or a bowl or a goblet or something. Sometimes those pieces are only attached by a quarter inch, maybe less. But since this piece is so heavy, you need that surface area. So they wanted to take that off so it was flat to the shoe. There was nothing in the way that maybe could break the piece at that spot, you know, added stress. Yep, I think that's why they did it. I'm pretty sure. That's the reason I would have done something like that. The other thing is, is all that stuff has to come off. And that happens in the cold shop. So any glass that's left over on the bottom has to come off anyways. And that'll take hours to, to grind all that glass off so it sits flat on a pedestal at your home or in a museum. Oh, hey. All right, some technical difficulties. That was the, I don't know, I think that was the You want to check it out, Robin? Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know that was happening yet. Okay. All right. So we got a one of the arms broke, and uh, yep. So Julie, Julia is going to make a new one. Okay, so we are approaching the moment where we are going to bring the torso of the bunny and attach it onto the waist or the top of the trousers. And so Julia is letting Robin know that she's ready, dictating when to take this next flash of heat so that we've got the perfect temperature 
on the trousers of the bunny, the perfect temperature on the uh, edge of that shirt that they are going to fuse. We need this connection to be really hot, really strong, and definitely permanent. You know, bringing two pieces of glass together is an inherent stress point in glass. And so we don't want this to come apart later on. But again, beautiful job lining that up. And here's the moment we do need to crack and break the punty free from the top of that shirt. So he's holding a metal tool right on that constriction line. They're dripping water to create thermal shock. Beautiful break. <laughs> Nicely done. And George's job just got a whole lot uh, more intense because that bunny rabbit is getting heavier with each component that we add. So that is a, a traditional way of working where you bring two pieces together. And the name for that technique is encalmo, which I think comes from the Italian word to marry when you talk about you know, sticking two pieces and parts together. And one of the things that you always want to be conscientious about is gravity, that as you bring together those two hot pieces of glass, they both want to fall down toward the ground. Or if one is hotter than the other, they might be falling at different rates. And so to have these two objects that are falling, maybe in unison, maybe not, but to have them perfectly aligned, you, you know, you don't misalign those two objects is one of the big challenges. And they just beautifully situated that little bunny torso right on top of his waist or right on top of his hips there. And so there was uh, quite a bit of activity happening on the stage. And you might have seen a little bit of glass breaking over here. And so what happened is we retrieved one of the bunny rabbit's arms or sleeves from the furnace right here, and it broke. Uh, what happened is that it uh, was a little bit too cold. And so when it came out of that garage, when it came out of that 1,000 degree oven out here into the ambient temperature and then into the 2,000 degree oven, it went through thermal shock. If you think about pouring room temperature soda over ice cubes, how that makes your ice cubes uh, crack from the sudden temperature change, well, glass also experiences thermal shock just at a, a higher temperature. And so the sleeve did break, but uh, of all the things that could go wrong, this is a really manageable project. And of course, we planned it earlier today for educational purposes. Julia says, no big deal. She's just going to hop over here and make a new arm while we get everything else situated. So those of you joining us here in the amphitheater, those of you who are joining us online, 2300 is one of our favorite events in Corning. We've got great live music happening in the auditorium. And of course, uh, we always have a fun lineup of visiting artists. And today we are joined by Robin and Julia Rogers. And so this creature that they're creating, it's going to be a bunny rabbit. Uh, in the uh, kind of iconic gesture of Little Joe. So if you're from the Corning, you might know about the, the beautiful tower that we have here. And you can see the silhouette of a glass blower on top of that tower. And so they're creating that same pose, but with a bunny rabbit. So it's a, a really beautiful, really playful uh, sculpture that they're creating. And very near and dear to my heart. I'm a big fan of bunny rabbits and glass blowing. So this is just a great day. If anybody has questions online, we've got Amanda here to help field those questions. If you have questions right here in the amphitheater, you can flag me down. I'm happy to answer them. All right, so we have a question, you know, what is going to happen to this bunny rabbit when it comes out of the annealing oven after it's cooled down? And we don't know yet. So I just asked Julia. She says, that, you know, it doesn't have a, a designated home yet. She says she's got to see what it looks like. You know, once we uh, put all these pieces together, it's going to get put away into an oven to cool down slowly. It'll probably be a few days before we take it out of that oven again. And so at that point, you get to inspect the object, you know, uh, really make a decision as an artist if this is your vision realized. And then from there, it could go any number of places. Uh, this is part of a, a bigger series of work that they've created uh, with these beautiful animals and these uh, really fun gestures, different poses, anthropomorphizing. And so we can uh, see if it joins that collection on display somewhere or not. Uh, Julia and Robin come from Norfolk, Virginia. 
Okay, so Robin says the next piece that uh, they're creating is the collar. So he's gathered a little bit of molten glass from our furnace. And it looks like he's not doing much. So my guess is that he's letting that little bit of glass cool down to the point that it's uh, not moving so much, that it's a little bit more stiff. Then he can connect, collect another layer of glass on top. You know, the glass inside this furnace is just so hot and soft. It's runny, it's drippy, it's the consistency of honey. The only way to get a large quantity is just to build it up layer by layer. So there he goes with his next gather. Julia stepping right up to take another gather for the sleeve. We've actually got a great animation that maybe we can play on our big screen TV that describes the animation, uh, or sorry, the uh, gathering process. If you look at that screen, you can see a cross section of the furnace. There's a great big pot inside that furnace. It's called the crucible. It's hemispheric shape. And if you imagine having a bowl of table honey in front of you, dipping a chopstick down into that bowl, twirling it, trying to wind out as much honey as you can on the end of a stick, very similar to what we do with our blowpipes and our punties and our molten glass. Now, of course, all the glass that we melt here in this furnace is beautiful, pristine, clear glass. But the collar of the shirt needs to be a, a nice, colorful collar. So we can add that uh, with different powdered glass or frit, basically glass that we melt into the surface. And so looking at that glass, I'm going to guess that the collar of the shirt is the same color as the rest of the shirt. But right now, it's above 2,000 degrees, and so it's glowing orange. I'm just trying to guess what that you know, blue-green color is going to look like at a, a higher temperature. So while Robin is making the collar and Julia is making the sleeve, George and Heather over here have the pretty stressful task of babysitting the body of the bunny rabbit. They have to keep taking these flashes of heat, keeping it all nice and hot, keeping it at a temperature where it won't crack and break, but also being so careful not to undo any of the finished work. If we get this a little bit too hot, well, that body would start to move around and wiggle and change shape in a way that uh, Julia and Robin don't intend. Uh, he could even overheat it to the point that those beautiful details, the little buttons on the shirt, the little pleats and ruffles around the waist of the shirt where it's tucked in, the fancy buckles on the uh, boots, all of those things could start to melt away. We could lose the detail. And so it comes down to George's experience, knowing the exact amount of heat that he can give that sculpture without uh, damaging it. And so if that weren't enough activity, we've also got Jeff, Mack, and Aaliyah over here at the garage. Remember, we've got arms, uh, another arm that we want to add. And this garage, the way it, it works, there's the burner in the far end. So that's where the flame is. That's the hottest end of this chamber. On my end, it's a little bit cooler. And so we store the objects at the cool end of the garage. And the cool end is still above 1,000 degrees, right? Really chilly. Well, at the cool end, everything is sitting nice and stiff and stable. We attach it to a punty keep it inside the garage and scoot it down to the hot end. That's going to help ease the transition to uh, heat it up to the point where we can attach it to the rest of the sculpture. And so the issue with the first sleeve that broke is that it didn't have enough time in the hot side of the garage to survive that transition. So we're being especially attentive with the next sleeve. And looks like Jeff feels ready. He goes right over to the reheating furnace over here. And so I hear dramatic noises, but I see a sleeve that is still intact, so we can feel good. I don't know if you guys are on the edge of your seat, but my heart is pitter-pattering. This is a pretty exciting piece of glass to put together tonight. All right, so looks like the sleeve survived. And look at what Aaliyah is doing over here in the corner. Can you see that she has a little straw whisk broom, and she is sweeping this piece of glass? So inside the garage, it's um, kind of paved with bricks. And they're refractory bricks. They're uh, kind of dusty. If you were to rub them, you get kind of a white dust on your fingers. So when we leave things in there, uh, we don't want them to stick. So that dusty surface is really ideal. Things can lift right off. But sometimes it lifts a little bit of dust out with it. And so right in this moment, before we give it too much heat, if we sweep it, we can sweep away any of those impurities that might be sitting on the surface. You neglect to do that, well, they're going to kind of embed themselves in the sleeves of the rabbit and it'll look like little ugly white crumbs of brick. So 
that sweep is really an important step. And again, one of those good hot shop smells that I like, the smell of burning straw, because it is a sleeve that's over 1,000 degrees. Now, earlier today, as Robin and Julia were making all the different body parts, they made the head of the bunny rabbit, they made the hands, they made the sleeves, they made the boots. Well, they did each body part, you know, left side, right side, left side, right side, all the way through. And that really helps. If you want to make hands that match, sleeves that match, shoes that match, making one right after the other means that all of those moves are fresh in your mind. You know, your spatial relationships are right there in your memory to draw from. It's much easier to make matching parts. But now we're in a situation where Julia has to make the second sleeve hours after she made the first one. And so she's... Uh, Checking in with Jeff, she's inspecting the first finished sleeve, and that's helping to inform her decisions to make the matching one. What makes it harder is that we're not making two identical parts. We have to make a right arm and a left arm. So everything is, is mirrored. You don't get to make two completely identical objects. So it looks like we've added the collar onto the torso of the bunny rabbit. And so this serves a couple of functions, right? When you looked at the top of the shirt before, you could just see how it all kind of came to a tight constriction line. It really, um, as a glass blower, looks like an unfinished section of glass, the way that the shoulders just rounded up to that little hole. You know, not only is the collar a fabulous accessory and a way to cr make the shirt way more fashionable, it's going to really beautifully um, disguise the seam between the bunny rabbit's head and how it nestles down into kind of the neck and uh, really make the sculpture come together. I think one of the most fun parts of sculpting glass animals is adding glass accessories. So it's, it's fun to see how they've chosen to dress their bunny rabbit. Little Joe, or Uncle Joe, as they've named it. Those of you who have just joined us from the auditorium, uh, thank you. But I encourage you to take a lap around our mezzanine here in the amphitheater. You can see the illustration of the bunny rabbit that we're creating right here on the hot shop floor. But we've been using that drawing all day long to take measurements. You know, as they've made the different body parts and pieces, they actually size the mass of glass they have on the end of the steel to the drawing on the floor. And so it's been a, a to scale blueprint for the day. All right, so here we go, attaching the right arm of the bunny rabbit. You can see the heat and look at that. It just came off beautiful and clean from that punty exactly in place. You can see the, how the folds of the elbow are kind of scrunched up there. That's where we're going to attach the arm and forearm and hand of the bunny rabbit. It's a beautiful, successful transfer. And again, even more weight that George has to carry back and forth. So those of you sitting in this section of the audience, can you folks feel the heat coming from the furnace over here? So can poor George, right? And so every time he takes these heats, you can see Heather's actually sliding a big metal screen between the furnace and George's hands just to help deflect that. But I think a lot of people watch glass blowing and they marvel at how glass blowers are able to exist in this environment, how we're able to work and not get injured. You know, my mom is a nurse and my dad's an insurance agent and they want me in a, a much uh, better outfit than what I'm currently wearing. They want me in a fireman's coat at all times. They want to see us wearing big Kevlar mittens. My dad would probably feel better if I wore a helmet all the time at work. But, you know, we actually need to use our body, use our senses to know when we're working safely. We need to feel the heat. Uh, so I'd like to describe that glass blowers understand the difference between being uncomfortable and being burned. Okay, so we can work uncomfortable. We know that threshold. We know that when we're about to cross that line to injury, we make the decision that we can sacrifice our art and we can save our skin. We can move away from the hot thing. We can dip our hands in a bucket of water if we need to. So we, we definitely feel the heat, though. We just uh, try and work as safely and efficiently as possible.
And so they're getting ready to continue shaping this sleeve over here. And it looks like we have another massive gra glass that will be attached right onto the tip. So leah has got that. She presents it to Julia. And the pair of shears that Julia has in her right hand, they're called diamond shears. They've got these uh, kind of bent blades that help her squeeze the glass, cut it to a fine point. And so she can take that kind of mass of super hot, gooey glass right now and crease it and sculpt it and fold it into um, what will eventually be kind of the elbow and scrunched up sleeve of the bunny rabbit shirt. Now she has to do this move as quickly as possible. You know, you can see the color fading from the glass. That's how quickly it's becoming stiff. So she goes right in, shapes it, and then still having to go back for those flashes of heat. You know, back where the uh, shirt of that bunny rabbit is attached to the blowpipe, we want that area to be stiff. We don't want the whole arm to be moving and falling and flopping around. But of course, we need it to be hot enough that it's stable. So get the flash of heat, then we can continue kind of fine tuning those little details. And so this is neat. She's actually kind of tweezed and pinched a little section of glass out, and she's continuing to kind of pull it and snip it with her uh, shears there. And so that pulling motion helps stretch what will be the point of the rabbit's elbow. You know, every single move is so well rehearsed. You know, they know exactly the way that it's going to impact the uh, shape of the sculpture. And so what part is this, Robin? Ooh, so we're adding the belt, adding the flare and accessories for the bunny rabbit. And so this was part of the discussion earlier. They didn't know if they would add a belt. But since we have this interval, while we're waiting for sleeve number two, Robin can create the belt and attach it. And so he goes right over here to our color booth. You know, colored glass is made by adding different metal oxides to clear glass. So we're working with different shades of blue and green. Well, iron oxide or rust, that can create green glass. Chromium can also create green glass. Uh, cobalt, copper, they can help create blues. And if you want the glass color to be opaque, you can add fluorine. And so we have uh, manufacturers who practice all of this perfect chemistry to give us our glass colors. And we can buy it in a lot of different forms. But the form that Robin and Julia are working with is glass powder. And so it's one of the few times where we are, um, have to be particularly health conscientious here in the hot shop. You know, as we're working with molten glass. There's no fumes or smells or things that we have to worry about inhaling. What we want to be careful about is not inhaling any glass dust. So when we have this powdered glass color, we use a booth that is ventilated. So if any of the powder were to rise into the air, it gets sucked into a filter and not into the space where it could be uh, harmful to our health. You don't want that silica dust in your lungs because your lungs can't get rid of it. And so we're about to transfer the sleeve off of the blowpipe. And so we've got a punty attached right where the elbow is. A little drip of water is making a stress point or a weak area in the glass. And look at this little tap, perfect break, beautiful transfer. And so now that is a sharp, broken edge of glass where it came away from the blowpipe. So the next step will be to heat up that area to uh, give it the contour that they're looking for for a nice shoulder that matches the one that she created earlier. And then we'll fuse that right on to the torso of the bunny rabbit. So moving right along. And if you're join us, joining us online, and if you have questions, you can uh, submit them in your comments. Amanda's here to answer questions. If you've got questions here live in the amphitheater, I'm happy to field those as well. So uh, flag me down. So this piece of equipment that we just rolled over is a pipe cooler. I'm curious if we're going to cool down this big steel handle here. You know, the uh, pipes and punties that we work with, they're made of stainless steel, which is a really poor conductor of heat. So where you see the gaffer's hands holding onto the metal, you know, they still have all of their nerve endings. Their hands are perfectly safe. That metal is comfortable enough to touch. Oh, look at that. We're adding the belt. Beautiful. And so he got that little bit of glass so hot, 
that it really behaved like super hot, stringy, stretchy pizza cheese, okay? So he stuck that down. He controlled the weight or the diameter of that wrap of glass with how close he held his steel rod to the bunny rabbit's body. If he wanted that belt to be skinnier, he would have stretched the glass further away. If he needed it to be thicker, he would have held it closer. But that was a beautiful draw. Let's give him a round of applause to Robin for applying that belt. And so something tells me that's not the first rabbit he's accessorized, right? If you have never done that move before, you might end up with a belt that looks a bit more like a pregnant snake, right? Where maybe you stick it down, it's got a thin section. If the heat and the temperature aren't perfect, then maybe a big lump of cooler glass will come off and stick there. And you have this kind of uneven, lumpy wrap of glass. But that was just really, really beautiful. And so we can see that's still glowing. You can see that's the hottest section on this entire sculpture. And so that tells us he still has a moment to manipulate the glass. So he's coming in. This tool is called Jax. He's got this uh, big steel uh, handle tool. It's got a flat strap on the back, and he's using that to paddle the belt. So he just gave it kind of a nice flat effect. So it's not going to be like a rope around the bunny rabbit's waist. It's going to have that flat profile. And now you can see the color changed, right? You can see how the, the glow has faded from that section. If he wants to continue changing the belt, he's going to have to he heat up the entire thing. You might run the risk of the whole waist of the bunny rabbit starting to move around. You might end up with a hula hooping bunny rabbit at this point. So you know, kind of going back to planning ahead, thinking about your moves, being as efficient as possible on a sculpture like this, uh, so important. And so we'll see how detailed he gets with the belt. We'll see if the bunny's going to get a belt buckle, if the, they're going to add belt loops. We're not sure. Oh, I heard he's adding a belt buckle. More flair. All right, so we have rolled the, the pipe cooler nice and close. This is spicy, guys. So what we want to do is cool off that piece of steel. So this is a big box that's got water. And Jeff has a pump here that as he pushes his foot on the pedal, that's pumping water over that handle. And so that is going to allow him to hold on to the metal rod closer to the object, right? The hotter it is, the further you scooch your hand away from the object. Well, the further your hand is, the heavier everything feels. So cooling it down is hopefully going to let him spread his hands out, give him a little bit more stability. You know, when we had just uh, the boots and the trousers of our bunny rabbit, we were thinking, we're just north of 20 pounds. We've since added the torso, the collar, the sleeve, the belt, and we've still got quite a ways to go. So the, the weight is really growing. Uh, we guesstimated that we would end up with an object that weighs at least 50 pounds. But remember, that's 50 pounds on the end of this blowpipe. And this pipe itself, just the naked piece of steel would weigh over 20 pounds. So that's all of that weight, basically like holding it in a 20-pound steel shovel. Okay, and the further it is away from your body, the heavier it feels. So you can see as Jeff moves that object from the yoke to the bench rail, we want to roll that yoke as close as possible. He wants to make that move as smoothly as possible. And as he sets the glass down on the metal yoke or on that metal rail, he also has to be as gentle as possible. If you hit the rail too hard, you're going to create a vibration vibrations like to break glass. So anytime we set it down, we want to be very gentle, very ginger, so that it uh, just kind of glides into place. <gasps> oh, So you might want to draw your attention to Robin over here. He's got just a tiny little bit of glass, and he took some gold leaf and melted that onto the surface. So he actually has coated this little bit of glass in gold and this is going to be the belt bucket buckle. So it's going to uh, be a really fancy, shiny, metallic golden belt buckle. And so he says, just one moment. Julia says the sleeve is ready. Robin is going to add the belt buckle. And I think he's going to create a prunt or a stamp to give it a little bit of a, a design element here. 
We've seen him, you know, the, the belt buckle and the belt were an afterthought. They were kind of a, a decision that they made on the fly live here in the shop tonight. And when that happens, you see some really interesting moves, um, things that are kind of uh, MacGyver moves. But he's cutting this little bit of glass free. And then he's reaching for one of our optic molds. It's a little uh, metal mold that this one is triangular shape. And so it's a, a round, uh, looks like a little round cup. But all the way through to the bottom, there's a, a triangle kind of milled out of the steel. And so he's heating up that and then just stamping it with the optic mold. That is definitely not the normal application of that tool. But I think you know, that is the best possible tool you could reach for when you're making a belt buckle for a small glass blowing bunny rabbit, obviously. OK, so he's got his flare. He's got his belt. He's got his belt buckle. He's got little buttons running up the length of his shirt. He has a fabulous collar. We can see the folds in the elbows. And it looks like sleeve number two is ready to go. And so the sleeve number two is going to be attached. And we're already thinking ahead. Robin says he's going to start heating up the head of the bunny rabbit. So the head of the bunny rabbit has been stored inside the garage. It's been in the colder side, right around 1,000 degrees, well, close to the burner. Maybe it's closer to maybe 1,100, 1,150 degrees Fahrenheit. So he's going to scoot the head down to that hot area, get it ready to transition to the 2,000 degree reheating furnace, and then get attached to the neck of the bunny. This is so exciting. Now, this is a, a fun crowd that we have here tonight. We've got a full amphitheater. We've got music that's being piped in from the auditorium as well. And we've also got a lot of chatter coming from the team. They are shouting at one another. They are in constant communication about the stage that they're in, the temperature of each piece of glass so that they can fuse it, they can bring it together at just the ideal uh, timing and temperature. Again, just looking at this object, we can see it inside the reheating furnace. I'm so impressed with the proportion of this torso, the way that the shoulder and the upper arm are situated there. And here comes sleeve number two. And so just kind of a last little blast of heat. And so right in this moment, she has one shot to stick in place the arm. If she sticks that in the wrong location, too high, too low, too far to the left or right, too bad. There's no unsticking this sleeve. And then to free it, they're just holding a cold metal tool right where the punty is connected to the elbow. So you can see those diamond shears are kind of grabbing on, cooling the glass. They're dripping water, creating more thermal shock. Holding up another tool there, creating a vibration. Perfect break. Nicely done. Whew. So again, you saw how they had to bonk the metal uh, rod, that punty that was holding onto the elbow of the, sh of the sleeve. When they bonk the glass like that, that creates that vibration, that creates that terrifying moment where I am so scared it's going to break in the wrong spot. But every transition here has just been beautiful. A lot of that credit goes to the entire team for taking these flashes. Remember, every one of these uh, kind of uh, trips into the reheating furnace, I like to think of a flash of heat like a nice warm hug, right? It helps keep everything together. But they have to manage that so beautifully. And so Robin over here, very carefully poised with the head of the bunny in the hottest section of the garage. Your view on this side of the amphitheater of the garage is pretty boring. Just looks like a great big black box. But if you do want to take a lap around upstairs, you can see from this side, and you guys have a pretty good view. You can see all the little doors. I think this looks like a kind of like a medieval rabbit hutch, right? It's got little barn doors on it. There's a few sets of them can open and close them, but that's where we store all the glass pieces and parts. We have a little yoke set up in front of it so we can rest the metal and we can turn the pipes and punties with the objects attached inside. And so here, Julia is cleaning up the end of the sleeve. Where the punty came away, it left a little bit of that clear glass behind. It's actually designed to do that. You know, we don't when the, when the punty breaks free, we don't want to take any shirt with it. We want to leave a little bit of glass behind. 
and then she can just go in and clean that up. Gives her a lot more control. You know. And so more good communication with Aaliyah and Julia and Robin over here. Um, we're, you know, here's the bunny's head. And so uh, the ears are not attached yet. And so what you're looking at is going to be the neck of the bunny. So remember, this bunny rabbit, we want it in the little Joe gesture where it's going to be looking up. It's going to be holding the blowpipe up in the air. And so its head is going to be tipped right back. So this bunny is going to be looking skyward. And so you can see the neck just kind of coming down in the angle of that face. And so the ears will be added after that. Or it might go arms, then ears. Yeah, sure. So something we always want to be careful about as we reheat the glass is making sure we have good clearance with our doors. You know, hot glass wants to stick to other things that are hot. And if you were to accidentally tag the door, one of two terrible things would happen depending on the temperature of your glass. If your glass is really hot and sticky and you touch it against the door, think about stepping in chewing gum, how it stretches. You might leave like a, a stretchy goober of glass uh, kind of strung between the door and your piece. If you do it at a lower temperature, well, then you pull uh, crumbs of door, that refractory brick, they look like little uh, white crumbs into your piece. So either way, it's going to ruin your object if you bonk that door. So we always want to make sure we've got good clearance. But of course, because you here in the amphitheater can feel the heat, you know we want to keep them shut as much as possible as well. So one of the, the great features of this shop is the beautiful equipment that we get to work with. And these furnaces do a really great job of keeping up with large-scale work. You know, something that you run into from time to time as we open up all the furnace doors is that the temperature starts dropping. It doesn't recover. It, it gets cooler and cooler. It gets harder and harder to reheat the glass. But these furnaces are uh, serving us really well. Okay, so Julia has given Robin the uh, super secret signal. I don't know if you caught that. This is the signal to start torching the neck of the bunny rabbit. And so that means we are getting really close. And so good teamwork. Do you guys see how Jeff and George are moving the bunny around? Yeah, let's give them a great big round of applause. This is a feat of strength to see them come together. But just to help move from the bench rail to the yoke to be able to set that glass down gently without creating vibrations, you can see Jeff has a big pair of mittens on. Those oven mitts are made of Kevlar. It's the same material that a uh, fireman's suit is gonna be made of. And he's able to choke up and grab on to the blowpipe really close to that weight and help them manage it together. Nice job. And so those of you sitting here, you might see the movement of the glass. You might see how it keeps falling with gravity. And that is such a, a perfect temperature for it to be at. That tells us that there's enough heat in the uh, glass that's attached to the steel that it's not in any danger of breaking. But of course, the more flexibility there is, the softer the glass is, the more muscle it takes to keep it under control and keep it on center. You know, you can imagine that if this starts to fall a little bit off center, the amount of strength to turn it over 180 degrees once it, you know, kind of uh, falls away, uh, major, major muscles to flip it back over. So they want to keep it all under control. And so Robin is really heating up the neck of the bunny rabbit now. They did a little bit of a size up, you know, just figuring out the angle that he's going to need to come in making sure that the uh, diameter of both the collar and the neck is just right. And so we, we often refer to that as the price check. So then we can come back and do the, the true fuse momentarily. 
Uh, the head was one of the first things that I got to watch them make uh, this morning. And it was really neat to see the way that he uh, sculpted, sculpted the features of the bunny. And it was definitely a, a collaboration where the pipe got handed from Robin over to Julia for different parts. But my favorite part was when they inflated the chubby cheeks of the bunny rabbit. They wanted this bunny to actually look like it was blowing into a blowpipe. They wanted to inflate those cheeks. And so he got the cheeks nice and hot. They blew through the blowpipe, and you could just see them puff out. So it was actual air pressure. And here we go. Here comes the head. Tucking it right in there. And so they're holding the uh, steel shears right where they want to break that free from the punty. Little tap, perfect break. Nice job. All right, so now this head, this neck, this is the leading section that goes into our reheating furnace and it's the last section to come out, which means it's gonna be hotter than the rest of the object. Oh my gosh. So I don't know if those of you online can hear the noise in the uh, amphitheater, but as soon as we got the view of this bunny rabbit inside the furnace, it's like the Looney Tunes nightmare, right? <laughs> you can see those concentric rings around it. Um, that's pretty fabulous. But so the head, that's the leading end going into the furnace. It's the first section to come out. And so this is just by nature going to be the hottest area of our object. This is the time where we can adjust the gesture of the head if they want to do anything to uh, rotate that neck one way or another, uh, change the angle of his chin. They can do that. And so the tool he's using to move the head around are these cork paddles. And so you can see the sparks coming off of those cork paddles. You can see the flames coming off of them. They really are just a, a wonderful sculpting tool because they don't rob the glass of heat. They're very gentle. They don't leave tool marks behind. And you get the added bonus of the photo op when they do ignite. So it's one of our favorites. You know, if we were trying to move around the head, if we were trying to change the angle, bend the neck using a metal tool, well, the metal could actually shock and crack the glass. We like to say that steel will steal heat from your object. Cork is just not going to do that. Okay, so Robin's checking in over here. Julia is attaching the arm onto a punty. So the one of the arms is going to be the next feature to get added. And so each of these uh, subsequent um, appendages, accessories, different pieces of flair that we're adding onto our bunny rabbit, I think are getting more and more impressive in terms of the detail that they've added. If you look closely at the little bunny rabbit's head, you can see the chubby cheeks. You can see the bridge of its nose. They even added eyelids onto it. Uh, something that was really fun to watch this morning was seeing uh, Julia sculpt the hands of the bunny. Just the beautiful little paws, the uh, little gestures there. And so we like to uh, kind of work our way down to these uh, finer appendages, you know, these uh, little extremities on the glass, like the fingers of the bunny. You know, if they get attached at the end, they're going to be safer. You know, as we go for these big flashes of heat, little dainty objects are going to warm up really, really quickly, so they're more likely to lose detail. And then also, when you're out here at the bench, they're going to cool off really quickly. All the air can circulate around this little tiny digit or finger that doesn't have a lot of thermal mass to it. And so they get added closer and closer toward the finish line to just keep them a little bit safer, a little bit less vulnerable to all these transitions. Again, George and Jeff with this uh, really beautiful kind of buddy system of moving the, the bunny back and forth has been uh, a nice technique to see them refine over the last 30 minutes or so. So if you folks have questions, let us know. We've got Amanda here helping to answer your questions online. If you're watching on, on Facebook or our live stream through the CMOG website, she can help you out. If you've got questions down here, let me know. I'm happy to help.
So this tool that Robin is using to just kind of perfect the neck and uh, kind of push the, the fur down into the collar of the bunny shirt, it's called a taglio. And it's a, this time it's a steel sculpting tool. And it's got this beautiful flat surface and then this really nice kind of sharp edge. So he can go in and give great definition between the collar of the bunny shirt and its neck. Now, the temperature we're looking at the glass, the colors are quite true. You know, it's the, this entire object is above 1,000 degrees and it is glowing. But the bunny is going to be that really beautiful gray color. The shirt looks really green right now, and that's because of the yellow heat in the material. It's going to look a little bit more blue when it's completely cooled down. But you can see the true black of the boots. You can see the black on the bunny rabbit's belt. And so the, the colors at this temperature are similar to what we'll see in the finished work. If you are watching online, uh, we'll probably be posting pictures of the finished work in at least a few days. We want to give this bunny rabbit time to anneal. It's going to take a few days to cool down. But if you're a local, hopefully we'll, we'll have it out of the oven again a few days from now if you want to come on back and see it. But if you look up uh, Julia and Robin Rogers, you can see uh, a lot of their work on their website. You can link to that from the cmog.org website. All right, so Robin is heating up the right elbow of our bunny rabbit. We're getting ready to attach the little forearm and paw. And so being so attentive to this garage, we really want to make sure that the little hands, the little fingers, spend enough time in front of the burner inside this hot chamber before they transition out here into the relatively cold uh, hot shop. It's quite a shock for our glass to go through. So we're also cleaning up the uh, punty that's on the chin of the bunny rabbit. So remember, each time we kind of uh, free the steel rod, from the object that we're attaching. It leaves that little bit of glass behind. So Robin goes right in with the torch. He heats up the chin of the bunny. He tweezes the clear glass away and then cuts it free. And so all that's left behind is going to be the gray glass. Just loving this view that we have inside the furnace. I'm really excited for the bunny to get its ears. All right, so we have a great question here. Is there a limit to the length and the scale of things that we can make here in the hot shop? And I think one of the goals when we built this hot shop is to take away most of those limitations. But um, this reheating furnace that we're working with right here, I think it's about 38 inches in diameter. I'm not sure if uh, anyone can give me the exact measurements, but we're talking about 38 in, uh, inches in diameter. We don't want to exceed that dimension. And then the depth of it, I think this one is... Probably, I, I, I want to say it's at least four feet deep. And so if we make something that's taller than that, well, you better add that extra height in your final step. Right, or you can make multiple pieces and put them together after they're, uh, you know, assemble them cold after they're made hot. Another limitation that you might run into... Yeah, another limitation that we can run into is the annealing oven. So when this object is finished, we don't get to just set it out here on display and let everybody take selfies with the little bunny. We've got to put it right into an oven where it's going to cool down. And so when you see these great big ovens, these cabinets on both sides of the stage, these are all annealing ovens. So it's going to go into one of these. And so we can't make something that's going to exceed the dimensions of our largest annealing oven. But great question. Um, I, I would say another limitation that we should probably bring up is the muscle on your team, right? You know, you'd think that uh, one of these days we're going to present George with a, a project that'll be too big for him. But so far, every single time he says, all right, no problem. And so you can see it's definitely a lot of teamwork lifting this bunny back and forth. But I think nobody can handle this uh, scale of glass better than the team here. So again, if every time he stops turning, you can see the bunny start to kind of slump. You can see it start to fall with gravity. And that just tells me that he's got the perfect heat in the moil. The glass where it's attached to the steel, all that clear glass that will eventually be scrap glass, we describe that as the moil. And you can see just how there's just a little bit of flex to it. it tells us we're safe. 
it gets really, really rigid, that's where you get a little bit more nervous. And so we can see the uh, paw of the bunny rabbit has made it from the garage to the reheating furnace over here to the bench. And so she says a couple more flashes and she's going to be ready to present it to attach. When she attached the punty this time, it's right on the back of the hand. You know, we think about how we have to clean up that punty. We have to think about how we're going to clean off the uh, clear glass that's left behind. And so just thinking, what's the biggest, safest plane to do that? And then also, you know, what's, how is this going to be attached and what angle is going to face outward? You would hate to attach a punty uh, maybe to the palm of the bunny, and then you wouldn't be able to bring it into the body at the right angle. So. You know, every, every move here is so carefully calculated. And so Robin still heating up the elbow, making sure that when Julia is ready, that is, uh, is good and soft, that ready to make a nice, hot, strong fuse. And she's now heating up the kind of end of the forearm, ready to tuck in. I was asking Julia earlier if this is the normal scale that they work. Is this the size of all of their other bunny rabbits? If you uh, do get a chance to check out their website or look at their work in uh, person, yeah, they say a lot of the rabbits are, um, here, oh my gosh, you're saying this is a medium size? All right, I'm getting conflicting reports here. Julia earlier today told me this is the biggest bunny they've ever created. Robin just says it's medium sized. I don't know who's telling the truth. But they, they do have a, a series of these animals that are uh, doing people things. So again, you can see the shears that are in Robin's right hand. Those are specially made for glass blowing. But they're going to be a, a useful tool to help him kind of... Uh, kind of Edward Scissorhand this situation, give him a little bit more buffer room to guide that piece of glass perfectly in place. And so there we go. Sticks it in. We have to make sure that that is going to be a really hot permanent connection. If either the forearm or the sleeve were too cold, that's the area where it might break later. So we're trying to break the punty free. They're holding the cold metal. Nice break. Whew. And so that was a tense moment, okay? You might have seen how many times they had to tap the steel to actually get the punty to break. And all of that vibration, so close to all those teeny tiny rabbit fingers are, are scary. You know, that means that if it was a little bit too cold, you know, these thin pieces of glass are very fragile. They don't have thermal mass. They're getting chilly really rapidly, but they survived intact. They made it into that furnace and everyone I can hear in the amphitheater reacting to the view inside our furnace, our, our Bunny Rabbit just got a lot more menacing with his little claw here, but we're going to hopefully bend that into shape. Yeah. So the question that we have right here is, are the furnaces we're working out of electrically heated or are they gas uh, fired? And so these furnaces in the amphitheater are all powered with natural gas and forced air. So there's a big roaring fluffy flame in each of these reheating chambers. Uh, this uh, large chamber that we're working with today has uh, multiple burners on both sides of the furnace to give it a good even heat and also to help it recover that heat as we have these doors open for an extended period of time. If you get a chance to explore the Corning Museum of Glass, we have another hot shop uh, that's closed at the moment, but during our daily schedule, uh, we have demonstrations there for visitors. It's called the Innovation Hot Shop. That's a very unique glass studio because the furnaces there are all electric. So it's actually a, one of the a few places in the world where you can see an all-electric glass blowing studio. And it's a, a patent and a technology that's actually held by the Corning Museum of Glass. Our leader here at the museum, Steve Gibbs, and a furnace builder named Fred Mitz uh, worked together to create the all-electric glass blowing studio. But for this scale, uh, we, we like that gas because it recovers its heat so well, it's, it keeps that temperature really nice and high. And so you can see we've changed the gesture of the hand. We've bent the arm. We're trying to work it into position. 
If you are familiar with Corning, if you're familiar with the landscape here, you might have seen the iconic tower downtown that has the image of Little Joe. Little Joe is kind of our Corning mascot. He's a glassblower. You can see the silhouette of this glassblower kind of poised where his head is tipped back. He's holding a blowpipe in the air and his hands up against that pipe. And so we're starting to bend the arms of the bunny rabbit to match the gesture. You can see the drawing down here in the center of the hotshot floor. This is what we're going with. So you can see how the ears of the bunny will kind of be tipped way back, kind of falling down his back. And then he's looking up toward the sky with the pipe. And so to change the angle of the arm, we've got to heat up that whole shoulder joint. And so this is where our torches are so important. He's using that hot torch again. That torch, the flame is between three and 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, so extremely hot. We've got natural gas and forced air to give it that good hot temperature. And while they're spot heating just the shoulder, we're getting ready to rotate that shoulder, Heather was torching the connection between the boots and the steel. That's the most vulnerable area of the bunny rabbit. And so these cork paddles are such a, a great tool to use because he can kind of stabilize one area of the bunny, like the, he was holding it against the head of the bunny, and then pushing up on the elbow. You know, as this entire thing it has a, a high enough temperature that it kind of wants to flex and fall off center, he can support the weight of it a little bit with one cork paddle while moving the rest of the object. Julia has moved on, and so we've got the other hand of the bunny rabbit inside here. And the ears of the bunny, are they pre-made or are they going to be, they're pre-made? Okay, so we've got one hand and two ears yet to go. So I was getting to chit chat earlier with Robin and Julia, and I learned that uh, Robin and I both got our undergraduate degree at the same place. We both went to the Columbus College of Art and Design in Columbus, Ohio. Julia got her undergraduate degree at Southern Illinois University. She got her master's degree at Bowling Green State University. And Robin got his master's at Southern Illinois. They originally were working together in Montana. They owned a studio together. They started creating work together. Uh, they went on to graduate school, and they're now based out of Norfolk, Virginia. And so, so I feel very lucky that we got to bring them out to Corning to spend the week. They've been doing demonstrations in our amphitheater this week. They get to do the 2300 event. And it's uh, one of our favorite things uh, as part of the team here, getting to bring in these different artists, uh, work on these uh, different projects expand our repertoire as a, a team and assistants here. So we have the, the question that says, how does one acquire uh, a, 
uh, this bunny. How do you get that? How do you get that bunny? She wants to keep it, take it home with her, adopt it. Um, you know, I, th I think you're going to have to talk to Robin and Julia about it. Uh, we've asked them earlier, and this bunny does, isn't spoken for yet. They don't have a, a home for it just yet. You know, part of the plan is to uh, take it out of the annealing of and evaluate it, decide uh, how it's going to fit into their body of work. All right. Well, if you're if you're interested in the bunny, you should know there's competition for it. So you know, maybe maybe you should just start the bidding. And so the tool that uh, Robin now has in his right hand, that's actually a little tiny, adorable blowpipe. Remember, we are making little Joe the little glass blowing bunny rabbit. And so he's got a little uh, piece of steel there and he's measuring it. He's seeing how it's gonna be aligned inside the bunny rabbit's paw, how it's gonna uh, fit up to the little bunny's face. And another fun feature of this little blowpipe is that they've already made um, a bubble that's going to be attached to the end of it. So if you are familiar with Little Joe, you know it's the silhouette of the glass blower holding the blowpipe up in the air with the round bubble on the end of it. Okay, and so that Robin says, maybe a slight design change. Maybe Little Joe is going to be pointing that blowpipe somewhere else, maybe back toward Norfolk. We don't know. But... Uh, the question that we just got is, how long will we anneal this bunny rabbit? So George says, probably 45 hours. And I would trust George to, to guesstimate appropriately for a large-scale sculpture like this. But ultimately, that decision will be up to Robin and Julia. And so you're right, it doesn't seem very long. The length of the annealing time is dictated by the thickness of the glass. All these body parts on the bunny are blown. So it's mostly a hollow object. You know, things like the little fingers, maybe they're solid, but they're dainty. So when we think about annealing times and temperatures and, and why they need to be as long as they are, let's imagine that I am made of glass, okay? My little pinky finger is gonna cool down pretty quick, no problem. My, my belly might take a little bit longer to cool. There's some thermal mass there. It's thick. And so these thick and thin areas, if they are cooling and shrinking at different rates, that builds all this stress and tension into the glass. The glass will relieve that stress and tension by exploding, okay? So the goal is to have the skinny areas like the pinky finger of the bunny rabbit and the thick areas like the belly of the bunny rabbit all shrink in unison and so that's what, uh, that's, that's the goal. The belly is not solid, but it's thicker. You know, you think about that um, t-shirt where it, or sorry, the, the dress shirt where it's tucked into the pants, that's two thick sections of glass that are coming together. That creates mass. You think about the belt that's wrapping around the uh, hips of the bunny rabbit, the belt buckle, all of those things are adding some thickness. And so that's probably, I would guess, where the belt buckle is gonna be one of the thicker areas of the object. But. You know, an object, no area of this object is more than a, a few inches thick, so we feel like 45 hours is probably safe. Now, we, one of our largest pieces, or the largest piece of glass in our collection, you can see in the Innovation Gallery, and it's actually the Mount Palomar Telescope lens. So it's this huge uh, cast piece of glass. When they cooled that down, it's several feet thick. They cooled it down for 11 months. Okay, so the thicker your object, the longer it's going to need to cool off. When we make uh, sand casted glass, when we cast solid glass into molds, you know, some of those projects will be cooled down for weeks or months at a time. Yeah, so the other hand has come out of the garage. It went for a flash inside the reheating furnace. Looks like she's got the punty addressed on the back of the palm. And now we're heating up that little end of the forearm to tuck into the sleeve. And so I think uh, George and Jeff are going to earn their gold sticker tonight for the feat of strength of moving this bunny rabbit to and from the reheating furnace, taking all these flashes of heat. You know, as we wait on each of the body parts to come over, they have to keep this thing in constant motion, never stop rotating it, and of course, never let it get too cold.
So one of my favorite things about working in glass is the teamwork. You know, we're totally limited in terms of the scale and the complexity of a project uh, if we don't have a great team there to back us up. And so this is a really uh, fun project to see so many hands come together to bring this idea to fruition. But this is how Robin and Julia work all the time. They've got an awesome team back home in Norfolk who helps support them there to create their work. And glass blowing is a really wonderful universal language. So we can bring in um, you know, people we've never worked before, you know, introduce them to the hot shop, and a day later put together a project like this. So it, uh, I think, speaks to the um, community of glass blowers that exist worldwide, and then you know, the skill of the folks that you see right here in the amphitheater. So if you are joining us online, we're approaching the finish line. We've got a few more body parts to add to our bunny rabbit. We're going to add the arm, the left arm of the bunny right now, and then the ears. So all of these different body parts have been pre-made at the museum today. They got started at about 9.30 this morning. Okay, so I don't know if you could hear the communication happening just now, but they were positioning the arm, trying to figure out at what angle to attach it into that sleeve. And while they were eyeballing it and making that decision, the bunny didn't stop moving. Gravity, you can't turn it off. You can't take a break from it. And that bunny continued to kind of fall off center to the point where George had to make the call and say, you know, we've got to flip this back over. And so that starts an entire uh, new series of reheats, right? We're going to, uh, you know, I'll just kind of take a moment, give a flash of heat, and then come back together. But Robin and Julia are the gaffers of this piece of glass. That means they're the artists in charge. Heather, Jeff, George, myself, everybody here on the, the floor are here to assist them. But every once in a while, as the assistant, you know, you need to make this call and say, the timing isn't quite right. And so here we go, arm number two, tucks right into the sleeve, making sure that the thumb is facing upward, that the uh, gesture of the hand is going to support the weight of the little tiny blowpipe. Nice job. Whew. And so the hottest part, that's the part that's moving around. You can see that the elbow is flexing, it's wiggling. And so in this heat and the next, that's when we want to uh, establish the position. You know, the more reheats we have to take, the more likely it is that uh, the um, glass is becoming a uniform temperature, right? Right now, we want the joints to move so that they can situate the arms. If you wait too long, then suddenly you're going to risk moving around the entire chest, torso, bending the body out of shape. But that's where these torches can help us out as well. They can give us spot heats. Oh, and you can tell we are making some big glass when we max out the view inside that reheating furnace. I think that little camera in there kind of has a fabulous fisheye that captures as much of that space as it possibly can. But when we zoom in that bunny rabbit close to the camera, we can't even see his other hand anymore. And so more communication, you know, George tells them when they need to flip the bunny rabbit 180 degrees. The more it falls off center, the more muscle it takes to flip it again. Let us know if you've got questions out there, if you're joining us in the amphitheater, if you're watching online. You can relate all those questions to the team. And so we never forget about the finished areas of the sculpture, right? The legs, we want them to be rigid. We don't want any movement whatsoever. So early in the process, we made sure that the uh, feet were beautifully placed, that the ankles and the knees were bent at the right angle. And then we want them to freeze and remain that way. But we can't let them get too cold. So just going back, torching, is keeping it all safe and intact.
So I can feel the warmth behind me. This oven right behind me is the annealing oven where we're going to place the bunny when we're completely finished. So there's a, a layer of bricks in here. And, but when we lay the bunny there, we don't want to lay it directly on the bricks. We don't want to run the risk of scratching the surface of the glass. And so there's a material that we lay inside this oven that's called Frax. And I think of Frax as a glass duvet. It's kind of a, a pillowy material. And so we can lay the bunny right on that Frax, safe and sound, and we'll see him in a couple days from now. And so we're heating up the joint in the shoulder. We want to make sure that the gesture of the arms is going to hold our tiny blowpipe and our little bubble on the end of it. And even as they heat and turn, I can see the arm moving. When they flip it over and that hand hangs down toward the ground, I can see the weight of it start to pull and stretch. So you know, that torch is definitely doing its job. And then when they go for this flash inside the reheating chamber, well, that really kind of superheats the area that was just torched. You know, the best way that Jeff and George can gauge the temperature of the glass during the reheat is how much it's moving. You know, we can see the glow of the glass when they come out of the furnace. And, you know, we have that variable to, to give us an idea of the temperature. But for George, it's all about motion. He feels the glass flexing and falling. He feels a little bit of drag as he's trying to turn it over again. And especially now that arm that we've torched at the shoulder, he can feel the arm itself flex and move. And so you can see the hand just kind of scooting right into position. So I talked about this a little bit earlier, but one of my favorite parts of the day was watching them inflate the chubby cheeks of the bunny. And so uh, Robin was sculpting the head of the rabbit, and he had this bubble attached to the end of the blowpipe. He had started to create uh, creases where the bridge of the nose and the little lips and mouth of the uh, bunny were. He had created eye sockets. And then for the cheeks, he started to get uh, one cheek really nice and hot. He was uh, hitting it with that uh, super hot torch blasting it with heat, making it turn really nice and rosy. And then he had an assistant inflate through the end of the blowpipe. And because when you blow into the pipe, the area that's the hottest is going to um, want to move the most. That air pressure takes the path of least resistance. You can just see the cheek of the bunny, poof, open. He kind of uh, reined in the shape of it just by holding a cold metal tool all around that contour, you know, all around the edge of the chubby cheek, the cold metal kind of froze that other glass intact, right in place. And then it was just the untouched cheek of the bunny that got big and round. And so uh, doing that move twice to make those uh, matching chubby cheeks of the bunny, and making them mirror one another, is uh, really uh, fun to see. And something that they don't normally do. They've sculpted a lot of bunnies together before, but never a glass blowing bunny. So I think it was the first time that they had to do the, the glass blower chipmunk cheeks on it. And so this time, as the um, 
bunny was coming right out of the furnace, I could see in the shadow the glow on the tips of the finger. Remember how we talk about the, the daintier appendages? They are a little bit more vulnerable. You know, as the heat moves around, all those little fingers, they want to heat up really quickly. Well, that's an example of that happening. You can see the glow in the fingertips before you see the glow anywhere else in its body. But, you know, George understands the heat so well, he knows, you know, he can work right up to that threshold, but not move past it to the point that he's going to damage any area of the sculpture or undo any of the minutia that's being created. And so as we finalize the gesture of these fingers, you know, we're already communicating about the uh, ears of the bunny rabbit. And so we've already got one bunny rabbit ear attached to a punty. It's already on the hot side of the garage. And so here it goes out of the oven into the reheating furnace over there on the far right. And so that's always a moment. It's a, a little bit noisy in here, a little bit rowdy in here. But I listen. I listen to know if that was a successful transfer. Because there's a dreaded noise that can happen when you take glass from an oven, from a garage, out into the ambient temperature, and then into the furnace. The noise that you don't want to hear is the ping or the ting of breaking or cracking glass. Yeah, so it's uh, something that... Um, you know, even without looking at it, being this far away from Robin on that bench over there, I was, had my ears tuned in, hoping that I wouldn't hear that sound. And it looks like it was a great transition. You know, and we've been working on this project all day long. We started at 9.30 this morning. The assembly process, you know, started at 6 p.m. tonight. Actually, a little bit before that, probably about 5.45, and here we are. It's 8.29, and the whole team over here is smiling. I can see Jeff and George kind of uh, laughing and joking together. We've got uh, Robin and Julia, cool as cucumbers, bringing all these pieces together, communicating beautifully with one another, and that's why we love glass. We love this teamwork. We love this camaraderie. You know, and especially looking at Jeff and George do this move, this buddy uh, reheat on the bunny. If they weren't best friends before tonight, I think they're best friends after this move. And so there's a lot of conversation happening down here about the angle of the head and the arms and the gesture of our bunny, whether it's going to be like little Joe looking up toward the sky or whether it's going to be pointed somewhere in between. You know, my dad is, is not a glass blower, and he came and visited me in Corning uh, the first time, and he asked why there was a silhouette of a guy funneling a beer on that uh, tower in Corning. And so, you know, I think that's maybe not the, the intention of that artist. But if you don't know, that's the silhouette of little Joe the glassblower that we've got downtown. So making sure that we keep the tips of those boots nice and hot, but also not too hot. Um, you know, once we attach the ears, once we uh, put the little blowpipe in his hands, we are not out of the woods. The final step tonight is that we are going to have to break the bunny rabbit free from the metal iron. And where we want to break it is right where that uh, big kind of clear prong of glass is attached to each boot. So we actually want to crack it free in those two places simultaneously. And that's uh, already got me stressed out. You know, I'm, I'm thinking ahead, knowing that's coming up, and I'm uh, nervous for it. So. Uh, 
I, I love working on projects like this. I love sculpting different animals and different creatures, and I, I love being part of the team. Um, I think a role that I often take in these teams is uh, instigating additional accessories and body parts and features and things to add on, you know, suggesting crazier outfits, more flair. But I feel like Robin and Julia raised the bar on, on bunny flair. Look at that beautiful attachment of that long floppy ear. Oh, and what an elegant ear that is. Um, even here at this temperature, you know, it's uh, above 1,000 degrees. I can see that there's a different color on the inside of the ear versus the outside of the ear. You can see kind of that pink interior. And so we need to open up more furnace doors to make sure that we have clearance for the ear. Beautiful. Yeah, so the, we've got questions here about the body of work that Robin and Julia have created. And they have a, a series of work that's about um, these fantastic animals, um, these anthropomorphized animals. And so they've done a series of different bunnies, but there's other animals as well. If you take a look at the table over here in the middle of the amphitheater, you can see some different sketches. Um, they do a lot of really amazing birds, where they have birds wearing pretty fabulous outfits and um, yeah, you, I think their website, it's Julia and Robin. Oh, excuse me. It's robinandjulia.com. So Google that. You want to see the rest of the work. They have this series of animals, um, and they, they have different bodies of work. But uh, I think a, a message that comes through so clearly in their website and in their artist statements is that they are a collaborative team. You know, the ideas and the execution are kind of a union that come from both of them. So remember, each time we transition from that yoke to the bench rail, we want to make sure that that steel on steel contact is so gentle. They don't want to create a vibration. They don't want a dramatic bang because that could be the bang that instigates a, a crack somewhere that frees the glass from the punty. And so it really just further impresses us as we watch Jeff and George uh, do this conjoined glass blowing effort. All right, so I can see over there on the right reheating furnace that Robin has retrieved ear number two out of the garage. It's made it through that flash. We did not hear the dreaded ting, and he's heating up the, um, I need to work on my ear anatomy, the part of the ear that connects to the head. Now, I love the, the style of rabbits that they choose to sculpt as well. I've got a bunny rabbit at home who is a double-maned Himalayan bunny rabbit, but a better way to describe it is he looks like a dust mop. He's super duper fluffy. And I always want to sculpt my bunny rabbit out of glass, but I feel like a rabbit that fluffy instead of a silky rabbit, you know, needs to be made out of cotton balls. And so I really like the, the style of rabbit they've chosen, the way that they sculpt it, uh, the way they kind of break it down into these beautiful shapes, and it still um, has that really wonderful essence of bunny. And so the official name for the sculpture that they chose is Uncle Joe. It's modeled after Little Joe, the glass blower in Corning, New York. And the reason they settled on Uncle Joe to uh, name it is they said, as they talked to all the different locals around Corning, asking them about the Little Joe imagery, everyone says, oh, that's my uncle. That's my Uncle Joe. So we don't know if uh, everybody's related or if everybody's got an Uncle Joe who blows glass in town, but I think it's probably the latter. All right, so here's ear number two, sticks it right on. You can see how he kind of bends it back and forth and flex it, flexes the ear, making sure it's a good connection. There we go. Nice. 
So I was so impressed with that move because you might have seen how Robin was kind of bending the steel back and forth, making sure that that ear attached 360 degrees around the base to the side of the head. But as they're doing that maneuver, flexing the ear back and forth, you know, George and Jeff are communicating from the other end of the pipe saying when they needed to rotate the entire rabbit one way to the next. And so the fact that all these pieces and parts are moving and moving independently and can still, you know, successfully uh, transition uh, just speaks so, so highly of this team. So making sure that we can open up that reheating furnace all the way. And so we can still see the um, punty glass on the tips of the ears. These aren't uh, fabulous earrings. We're not accessorizing the bunny that way. We're going to strip that little bit of clear glass away the same way we have with all the other features. <laughs> So we can see the way that the pipe is now going to be situated. Our bunny rabbit is going to be in a more traditional glass blowing pose with that uh, pipe uh, pointed more forward than upward. And I have to think that um, maybe that has to do with the huge effort that it has taken to create this rabbit today that, you know, you might be a little tired. You might not want to hold that pipe strap in the air. You might be holding it out in front of you after an 11 hour day of glass assembly. Oh, okay. So we just experienced a, a little bit of uh, hearing loss, I guess. The um, ear <laughs> has broken off the bunny rabbit. And so um, what happened is you could see he was kind of tweezing and pulling a little knob, that little bit of clear glass away from the tip of the ear. And a common way to just free that is to bonk it. We've talked about these vibrations again and again and again. And he was trying to use in a vibration to just break the knob of glass off the tip. Well, that was a little bit too hot. The connection between the ear and the head of the bunny was a little bit too cold. And so it broke where we did not intend it. So there's um, different options at this point. Um, what it looks like we're going to add the remainder of the ear back on. So, okay, we're sticking it back on. And, you know, I think a big part of their artwork is narrative. So maybe there's going to be a pretty epic, dramatic story attached to this bunny rabbit about why one ear might be a little bit shorter than the other. We'll see if they stretch it, manipulate it, try and make it match the other one. Um, remember, the other ear still has to be addressed too. So, you know, they could just try and break that one off as well and, and really make them match. We'll see what level of uh, stress and excitement they want to bring to the crowd here tonight in Corning. But let's give them a round of applause for that little bit of quick bunny surgery. Um, um, again, we planned that earlier today. We thought this wasn't enough drama. You know, it might be minutes from the finish line. Let's break an ear off, you know. And so it was fun from my perspective while that happened. I didn't um, really even see the, the ear falling, but I felt the reaction from the crowd, right? There's an audible gasp. Everyone's freaking out. And then I look out at everybody's faces here, and I can see just defeat and fear and terror and sadness uh, in everybody's eyes. And if you look at the faces of the team... And there was no fear or defeat or uh, terror when the bunny ear hit the floor. Everyone just kind of breathe in, breathe out, and move on. You know, right away, Robin was picking up the broken ear off the ground. Right away, Jeff and George were picking the bunny up, going for another flash. Everybody just moves on. You know, we are used to breaking things. We're used to recovering those broken things. And I guarantee, as a glassmaker, you are going to uh, break at least as many objects as you successfully create. When you're learning to blow glass, it's a uh, cruel teacher. There's a lot of failure before you can start experiencing success. Oh, that's the cutest little bunny ear I've ever seen. You know, there are all kinds of bunnies out there. Chuckleberry, my bunny rabbit at home, really short ears. I think maybe they were inspired. It's the short-eared rabbit. Is there um? Do we have any bunny experts out there who might know the the breed of rabbit? Also, One of uh, Robin and Julia. Com or Julia and Robin. Either one. 
Oh, good. Okay, so earlier I thought I misspoke and said it was the website that you want to go and visit is robinandjulia.com. We found out it's Julia and Robert, Robin.com. It's actually both. You can go to either. They own both domains. It'll route you right to their website. You can see all of their work. <laughs> all right, so we've got a little ear that has uh, been through some pretty major cosmetic surgery. We've got a long ear that still needs to be addressed. We'll see if they match. You know, I think something that um, we comfort ourselves with as glass makers, you know, when you're learning how to sculpt in glass, you're working with this incredibly challenging material, you know, you learn that not that many things in nature are truly symmetrical. So there's a little bit of forgiveness there, but look at that. We've got a second crease. I think he's going to go with the more gentle tap. Okay. <sighs> All right, we've got two ears. They are very nearly the same length. I think just a little bit of tweezing and stretching and finessing, and we will have the bunny rabbit of our dreams. I think this is probably great news for Jeff and George as well, because as they do these reheats, it just got a lot easier to get that in and out of the oven. <laughs> So if anybody has questions, you can come on down. You can flag me. I'd love to answer your questions. We've also got Amanda here to answer your questions online if you are watching on our live stream. Okay, so it looks like Robin is ready to finesse the ears. And Julia is heating up the little tiny blowpipe. Okay, so this blowpipe is not going to be um, fused or adhered onto the bunny at this stage. But before we put it into the annealing oven, we want everybody here and everybody online to see it come together. So we want to just slide the little blowpipe into the hands of the bunny. This is scary because basically we are taking a piece of metal that's room temperature and putting it in the 1,000 degree palms or fingers of this little rabbit. That metal touching hot glass could thermally shock and crack the glass. So. We're preheating the metal. We don't want that to happen. We want to be able to uh, tuck it in there and not break it. And so that's what Julie is doing. She's torching the handle. The little bubble that's on the end, of course, was pre-made. It's already been annealed and cooled down slowly. And so as we heat up the handle, or the, really the mouthpiece of the blowpipe, she's being very careful not to get that little tiny bubble in the flame. If you were to uh, introduce room temperature glass to these temperatures, it will thermally shock and explode. All right, so here we go. Back to the bench. The question that we just got is, are they going to anneal the metal pipe along with the rest of the bunny rabbit? And I don't think so. I think, all right. <laughs> I think that's the plan. It's just to show you the, the finished idea. They're not going to anneal the, the pipe. So I think that might have been it. That might have been our view of seeing the pipe in the hands and in the mouth of the bunny. There's still so much flex and play in that uh, uh, punty the, where the moil is attached to the feet of the bunny that it's still falling with gravity. Look at that. Beautiful gesture. Little Uncle Joe. This might be really hot. Let's uh, tuck it maybe under the bench. All right, so we've created our rabbit. We've made sure that it can hold the blowpipe. Our last step is that we need to free it from the punty. So this is going to be the final break. Ideally, it will crack and break in the perfect spot. Jeff Mack is getting on his favorite outfit, right? You thought the party happened earlier with all the wineries and cideries from the Finger Lakes region spread out all over the museum. But uh, the, the disco is really getting started now because Jeff is in his big aluminum suit. He's going to put on his big space helmet because he has the um, very tense job of gently laying Uncle Joe inside this 900-degree oven. Now, 
If you've ever, you know, pulled cookies out of your oven at 400 degrees, you might have experienced the feeling of wanting to get them out of the oven as quick as possible and get yourself away from that heat source. Well, we have similar feelings when we load things into our 900 degree oven. But of course, you don't want to open the door, chuck the rabbit inside, slam the door. We want to very gently place it in there. This outfit is going to allow Jeff the, the comfort to do that safely. Now the glass is going to break wherever it is the coldest. And so all of these uh, heats and flashes that we're taking right now, the attention that Julia is paying with the torch is to make sure that every section of our bunny is nice and hot, that all of those joints, all of those stress points are uh, you know, above the breaking threshold. Then we'll go in and we will selectively cool off the area between the clear glass and the bottom of the boots. And so this time, as they reheat the glass, you can see how they're closing the furnace door behind. That is going to reflect some of that heat down onto the boots, um, you know, the, the boots, the knees of the bunny, where they meet the trousers. That's a vulnerable area. But then as we saw, even the, the area that was very recently attached, the ears, they're also pretty uh, delicate. All right, so we've got Heather helping move that bunny back and forth. And great teamwork with George and Julia right now discussing the temperature of the glass and at what point they're going to be ready to crack it free. I feel like my heart is just pounding right now. So excited to see this make it into that annealing oven. It looks like just our last little uh, bit of ear surgery here. A little heat, a little stretch, pointing that up. The shears that he's using to trim and stretch the ears are called diamond shears. They squeeze the glass to a point. If he did that same move with regular shaped scissors, you know, that would leave a little straight line in the glass. It would look like a little cut mark. But the diamond shears are just going to bring it to the, the really beautiful point at the tip of Uncle Joe's tiny ear. And so another thing that's so important as we go through these final heats is making sure that we don't change the gesture. We establish that they're happy with the way the hands are situated, the way that that pipe uh, fits so beautifully in his pose. You know, heating just a, a few seconds too long could be the difference. That could be enough to make an arm or an elbow swing one way or the other. You know, the weight of this glass, this asymmetrical body, um, means that, that that weight is... Um, constantly a factor with gravity, with centrifugal force, and with the heat. So if you hopefully are, have been watching, you are impressed. Hopefully it's uh, sinking in the amazing craftsman's, craftsmanship that it takes to create an object like this. Okay, so they're talking through the breaking. I can see Jeff has the helmet back on. They're assembling the right tools on the bench. So I think we're going to be pouring water right over the little constriction lines. The, the clear glass below the boots has little uh, lines or creases uh, kind of folded into it. They're like the lines in a chocolate bar that help you break the pieces apart. So we have those little score marks. You're going to see them drip cold water onto those lines. We're going to see them probably hold cold tools on that lines as well, or on those lines as well. And then they're going to introduce the vibration to crack the glass. Uh, even the way that they... Um, introduce the vibration, they've chosen the right wooden board, right? You can bang the g pipe with any number of tools, but they really like the kind of the resonance and the weight of this particular wooden paddle to help free the glass. And so every, every step of that process is being communicated to the uh, right teammates so that everyone's in position when the time comes. So when we take that final heat, the little tips of the ears, the little tips of the fingers, 
They're going to be the most vulnerable. That move where he just um, addressed the tip of the ear again, did you see how he did that? How he got it super duper hot with the torch. He pinched it with the tweezer and then pulled and stretched it. It's, um, again, if you think about a uh, very stringy, hot, stretchy pizza cheese, pulling a piece of pizza from the rest of the pie, that's about how um, squishy and stretchy the glass had to be to do that move. But it just, you know, pulls it to such an elegant point, and it doesn't leave any tool marks behind. So, you know, every time they, they do a move like this, they're thinking about how the tool is going to uh, leave traces in the glass and whether that's desirable or undesirable. Okay, so here he goes. Jeff is ready in case our bunny wants to jump early. We've got a little squirt bottle here that we're gonna use to drip water on those connection points. You can see how it's flexing or holding a cold tool. Those are jacks that they're holding right over the constriction lines. There we go, broke free. Into the annealing oven, onto that little Frax blanket. Let's have a huge round of applause for our team, our amazing artists, Robin and Julia Rogers, enjoying a standing ovation here in the amphitheater. Amazing team helping them. We've got George Kenner, Jeff Mack, Eric Goldschmidt, Heather Spiewak, Eliana, Eliana Zephyr.